and Michael Remus. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Great to be back in the peg and great to be on the air talking about a hell of a team win by the Winnipeg Jets last night. Probably exactly what a lot of you needed to see as uh, there was quite a bit of angst despite the recent wins of the club as to whether they were ready for the playoffs. We'll see what happens over these next few games of the regular season and in round one. But the performance the Jets put forth last night in Dallas against the Stars in a shutout victory, a lot closer to the uh, style of play and the performance that they're, uh, they had done earlier on in the season and certainly what they're going to need to do if they're going to have any success in the upcoming Stanley Cup playoffs. A brilliant game by Loren Brassois, um, but overall the best team game probably in 2024 by the uh, by the Winnipeg Jets. We're going to get to all of that. We'll hear some of the post-game comments. We'll talk about it with Brandon Rewicki. And we'll also have Mike McIntyre join us. And Mike was in the Twin Cities last night to see the Frozen Four. And Rucker McGrory and the Michigan Wolverines lost to uh, Boston College, so they are done. Uh, I know Mike's got a big piece on McGrory tomorrow. Um, the intrigue builds now as uh, will he sign or won't he sign, and what that might mean for Rucker McGrory as early as next week with the organization, with the Manitoba Moose, or even the Winnipeg Jets. Um, that being said, I think we saw what the Winnipeg Jet game one lineup is going to look like against the Colorado Avalanche last night with the exception of David Gustafson who is in in the place of Nino Niederreiter who is still returning from that laceration on his leg um, and how about Gus getting on the board getting a jacket last night um, it was a, a nice performance by Gustafson and he certainly proved himself very capable of moving in in a number of different spots in that bottom six uh, to provide a great two-way game, and particularly the uh, the defensive responsibility that Rick Bonus is looking for from his club that we saw so much earlier in the year, and that it sort of lapsed a little bit in the second half. Um, but lots lots to get to as we uh, get ready to um, get ready for the big one tomorrow. As I said today on Twitter, we knew it was going to be the Central Division gauntlet. It started off with the Minnesota Wild not going to the playoffs. Check. The Nashville Predators, wildcard team, got the win, although <laughs> that was a Connor Hellebuck game. Last night, not the case at all. Everyone contributing uh, and uh, a big win. And now it's time for the final boss of the Central Division <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, Nathan McKinnon and the Colorado Avalanche. It's a 3 p.m. game. We'll be all over that. Uh, we're going to check in with our friends at Kids Sport and our Sport Manitoba it takes a community to play segment. We'll do a marble race as well. And as one of many golf fans' favorite weekends, if not the favorite weekend of the year, the Masters is on. We'll be checking in on the Masters throughout the afternoon. For our bre We'll do a few Breezy Bend golf reports today because uh, there is lots happening down at Augusta, including a real nice start for Canadian Corey Connors. Just before we uh, get the party started, a big thanks to the sponsors that make the show happen each and every day. Uh, the great people at Princess Auto, Cool Bet Canada, Breezy Bend Golf and Country Club, as well as Consolidated Supply, Modern Man Barbershop, Canadian Club, Manitoba Battery, Wallace & Wallace, Little Brown Jug, F Apparel, Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge, the Winnipeg Jets, Boston Pizza, Royal Sports, and we'll get to a why not question of the day for the gang over at why, uh, not Autocorp, but Waverly and McGilvery. Michael Remus, what's going on? 
I'm uh, getting playoff fever, Huss. I'm starting to feel good. Uh, had my first barbecue of the season yesterday. Uh, great time for that. Jets win, and yeah, we're just kind of counting down to the end of the season. But as you said, the final boss of the Central Division, even though they're battling with the Jets for for second place here, the Colorado Avalanche tomorrow. Big game for to determine, well, it could determine playoff standings. The Jets currently with a, they have the tiebreaker over Colorado. And we'll see what happens with the win. Uh, you know, I was, funny, you mentioned the standings as well. Uh, I saw Florida shut out Columbus yesterday. I was like, oh, what's how are the Jets going to respond? It was a push, a push in, in, in the, the Jennings race. In the, for the Jennings race, and yeah, uh, the Jets maintain their two-goal two goal lead on Florida, but Florida only has two games left, and the Jets have three games left. So they'll play, you know, five-game win streak, pretty good. And, you know, mentioned uh, that game against Nashville, you know, wasn't exactly the game you want to see. And I think there were some concerns after that six game losing streak. Well, can the jets find their game? And it certainly was uh, the playoff type game that you wanted. And they've shown this year repeatedly that when there's, you know, really big game, I go back to, you mentioned Boston to me before the show. Uh, I think the first Vancouver game, the Ranger game, but uh, last night, exceptional performance uh, all around. And they really can be there. I, I didn't think they were going to lose four times to Dallas. They play them tight every time, and uh, it was a well-played game yesterday. Certainly their best of the season against the Stars. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it is so funny. I mean, you can take a lot of angles with this team, and I, and I get it. Um, you know, there was a while where, oh, the Jets were just beating up on the worst teams in the league. Well, going into this, I saw, I think it was NHL Network put out, you know, who has played the best, who has the best record against the top seven teams in the NHL. Well, guess what? It was the Jets. They were like 9-5-2, and two, and of that, they were 0-3 against Dallas. But, I mean, it wins against Colorado. They swept Tampa. They swept Florida. They were 1-1 one one against Boston, 1-1 one one against the uh, the New York Rangers. So they've actually had some big wins and great performances against some of the top teams. Um, but this was a big test. I mean, we knew that this road trip was going to be, and, and listen, I mean, I was in the building on Tuesday in Nashville. We talked about it from Nashville on Wednesday. That was not a blueprint of uh, how you win in the playoffs. I mean, they were, they were on their heels for the better part of 50 minutes in that hockey game. But Connor Hellebuck was brilliant, and they ended up getting a win. How they responded to that. We heard from the players. They wanted to kind of move on from that one, but owned it that they probably didn't deserve to win that one. They deserved to win the game last night. And and I guess my question to you, Reem, is that can we for um, a, a few minutes or maybe two hours spend some time talking about the rest of the team and the playoffs and the avalanche as opposed to obsessing about who's going to play left wing with Mark Shifley for the foreseeable future. It's amazing how that conversation, and listen, I understand. I've been a part of it as well, uh, discussing, okay, the lines and who's going to be on that top line and the results with Shifley, and the, or sorry, the results with Connor and the results of Ehlers. Like, at what point do we just realize that, unfortunately, uh, those of us in the media, people on Twitter, don't make the lineup, make our points made, and then watch the game and see what happens. I saw some of the craziest tweets yesterday about people. Uh, the Jets are going to get killed. I'll be walking my dog. Uh, flag, not even paying attention. Well, if, if you walked the dog or you didn't pay attention to the game last night, you missed out because there's a hell of a lot more than two players on this team. And I think we saw the best of the Jets last night. And... I'll be honest, for a day at least, it's nice to be able to not obsess about one single decision that we may or probably most people don't agree with um, and look at a body of work that reminds us much more about a team that got people so excited about this club to begin with, um, you know, going into the new year. Yeah, I think when we talk here every day about the Jets, there is a bit of what have you done for me lately. And after a performance like the game in Nashville, um, you kind of wonder, what is this team? You know, they were so good in December, and they've been kind of been topsy-turvying 
throughout the second half here. And I do wonder how much is like motivation. They basically had a playoff spot wrapped up and we've kind of seen these second half slides here before. But I think when you keep, you know, when you go on that six game losing streak, your top line is getting the most minutes. They're not getting, they're not scoring goals and they're getting scored on repeatedly. I think it is important to have those type, you know, I think it's natural to have those conversations like, hey, is this, you know, what we want to do here going forward? And, you know, Connor and I maybe harped on it a bit too much, but I think it is worth noting that those guys has the top line as constructed with Shafi, Velarde, and, and Connor do give up the most goals, you know, per 60 minutes of any combination that's played over 100 minutes together. So I think it's interesting that they would continue to go, but I think from their perspective, they're saying, hey, we know that this is what's happened. Kyle Connor, you know, he was coming back from an injury. Velarde's been in out of the line. We haven't had these guys at full health. We think they're better than what they've shown. Now, yesterday, you know, they were they were even, and it was, the line, you know, the Ehlers line that scored the game-winning goal, the first goal of the game. But look, you're not going to have everyone going every game, and, and they're trying to get all the lines going. It was yesterday was the middle six. I'm sure Saturday it'll be different lines. But, you know, I maybe we do get wrapped up in a bit, and, you know, I see people chat, oh, you're talking about the lines again? But, you know, when you're having a six-game losing streak and your top, again, your top line's not scoring and getting scored on, I think it's they're legitimate questions, but as far as you know, not cheering against the Jets or not watching the game because you know we don't like some of the moves. I, I'm I'm certainly not there. Um, I know no. I know like yeah, and I know I talked with Connor and he wasn't you know, didn't feel great about the game, but they were underdogs. Yes, yeah, so they hadn't beat Dallas, so I think it was natural to think, hey, they're not they're not going to win this game. But hey, I looked at Lauren Brossois. He's had amazing numbers against Dallas in his career. And I just didn't think they were going to lose four times. They're, they're too good to lose four times. Those games are all really, really, really close to uh, that they played. Not the third one, but the first two are very close. Yeah. Hey, listen. I mean, come playoff time, if uh, if they go with the way things are set up right now and things don't go well and that line gets crushed and there's an early exit, there'll be tons of I told you so's and it'll be legitimate and the criticism will be warranted. I guess the my my point is is that I mean everything has been said that can be said so far, and and I think there's a lot of people and this is dangerous um, and and I think just from a fan's perspective, uh, it's a place that you don't want to be, where you get so invested in a take, in, in a line of thinking where this is the way it is and these guys are idiots and this is stupid and it's going to rope the team that you get to the point where. You're sort of hoping the team loses to make you look right as opposed to probably the reason why you care so much to begin with is wanting the team to do well. And I, again, it's just it's a little bit of perspective. And no one is going to agree with every decision that an organization or a team makes. Um, I would imagine many of those same people that are so caught up on this. And again, I'm not removing myself from this. I, I Look at the shows earlier this week and, and the last couple of weeks. This has been a, a major topic, and there's been the reason why we've talked about it so much. But again, uh, uh, at a certain point, it gets old. It turns people off. Um, and I think there's a lot of people that are just that, that, that said, okay, this is the way they're doing it. There's people that are paid a lot of money in Rick Bonus and the organization to put the out. These are their decisions. They're theirs, not ours. We'll talk about them after the fact. Um, and I've been talking about it throughout it, but I, I, I hope those people that have been so adamant on that were still able to get a little bit of joy and satisfaction about a game that, you know, was massive for the Jets, should give people more confidence than maybe they had had before, that this is still a good team. Like, Remus, you threw out, I, I mean, if you listen to some of the narratives and the conversation around this team, you would think that they were one of the more disappointing teams in the league that was just clinging to a playoff spot. They're the number one team in the National Hockey League in regulation wins right now. They've given up the least goals in the National Hockey League right now. You tell me about that in a vacuum of a particular team, and I'll say, well, that sounds like someone that can beat anyone and should be a Stanley Cup contender. Um, decisions will be made. They'll be critiqued throughout, but... This is a fun time of the year, and even if you've really been entrenched on one side of things, I think it's important to sort of take a step back, realize that no one's ever going to be perfect, you're not going to get everything that you want, and uh, 
Hope that your team goes out and maybe surprises a few. And shout out to the people that had a few Mia Culpas last night on it. That's what it's about. Um, that was a big, big win. Hopefully it got a few more people that had been really negative about the team. It reminded them that there's a lot that this team is capable of. And everything that happened in game 70 and 72 and 55 isn't going to mean a damn thing when you drop the puck in game one of the playoffs. And that is where this team will be will be judged on after a great regular season. And uh, I'll tell you what, last night, if they can replicate that a little bit more, we might not be talking about a team that, you know, peaked in the middle of December, shall we say, and uh, will be uh, will be a tough matchup for whoever they play, in all likelihood, the team that you're going to see tomorrow in the Colorado Avalanche. Yeah, you know, you talk about getting ready for the playoffs. I tweeted out a video of Joe Morrow's game-winning goal from 2018, securing the first playoff win in 2.0 history. And just watching <laughs> yes. that gets you excited, uh, seeing that environment. I remember even the first home game last year, I just got chills when they have, like, live in the whiteout on the Jumbotron. I'm getting goosebumps even talking about it, but it's funny. I'm looking at this comment here from Isha Boy Bruce who says, it's the consistency or lack of it that's uh, frustrating for so many, and I agree with him. I mean, it's been up and down, and Mike Kelly said it best on NHL Network last night. He tweeted out the video, uh, Mike Kelly NHL, saying, hey, when the Jets stick to their structure, they can beat any team in the league, and when they don't, they can't beat anyone. And we saw that in the six-game losing streak. They got away from it. I mean, they got embarrassed by the Islanders' loss to the Devils. And last night, they beat the number one team in the league, at least number one in the West, or is it Vancouver? Either way, the top team in their division in Dallas, who they hadn't beat all season. And it's amazing to read this uh, sports set stats, putting out 43 regulation wins, the number one team, even strength, goal differential, uh, plus 61, the best save percentage in the league. Um it's kind of crazy reading out those numbers and looking on the you know on the whole, hey, this is a really great team when you know we're kind of living in the micro day to day on oh well they looked like absolute ass against Nashville like Hellbuck saved them, you know, they couldn't do and anything won. and won <laughs> and couldn't like, I it's hard to believe. I mean that was a win. I've never been so negative about a win in a long time and you know they had that six game losing streak I keep bringing up and you're like, well, I think you've just kind of seen like second half slides before, you know, like bringing up the 2019 season, you know, at the forefront and you don't want to get, you don't want to get hurt again. Maybe. I don't know. I, Cause the anniversary of game five is coming up us. And I will, I want to say like, is that the lowest point well, in, I, in the, in 2.0? Well, that uh, entire, that entire second half of that season was, mm -hmm. was, was brutal. But keep in mind that team was, we talk about Stanley Cup contenders, and then there's Stanley Cup favorites. Mm -hmm. And the Jets were among two or three teams at the beginning of that season in the first half of the year and had just gone to the conference finals uh, before that I think people expected to win. Jets have exceeded everybody's expectations so far. We cashed our over tickets for the Jets points three weeks ago. Um so and, and 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 listen, it doesn't. And I get it. You want you would love to see your team play the best every single night and have that consistency. And you know what? The team that does that the most in the playoffs will be that team. But like the Jets are playing Colorado, they're a beast of a team. Nathan McKinnon might win the MVP. In the last two and a half weeks, they've lost to the Montreal Canadiens. They've lost to the Columbus Blue Jackets. They got lost by four last week to the Oilers, and the same team the Jets just beat in Dallas yesterday and shut them out put a seven spot up on them earlier this week. Like, this is why they play the games, everybody. And just because something happened at one point does not necessarily mean it's going to happen again. Last night's result was a perfect example. We all thought, oh, Dallas owns the Jets. Well, things can change. And, and, and just to... Because, again, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the lines. We have enough. Decisions are going to be the decisions. We'll see how it goes in the past. There's a lot of evidence that said there might be some better combinations. But Nikolai Ehlers looked real good last night playing with uh, playing with Sean Monaghan. Um, and I'll guarantee you this. If things look really bad for that line for a game or a game in a few periods... They'll change it up. I mean, you don't go out with looking at other options as well. But in the meantime, I think it's important for people to appreciate what this team's accomplished right now. 
uh, realize the fact that, you know, depending on what happens in this next week, game one of the playoffs might be in the whiteout right here. And wouldn't that be something, finishing ahead of the Colorado Avalanche with the season that they've had and going up against them? And, um, you know, getting ready to put the whites on and have some fun right now. So, listen, as much as, and here's the other thing. Like, there always will be, and again, hand up, we're guilty of it as much as anyone. We talk about this stuff every day. You all join us, and everyone's in the chat on it. And sometimes we get focused in on one thing that is a hot-button topic that a lot of people are talking about, and that for the last couple of weeks has been, it basically has turned into an entire conversation about Nikolai Ehlers versus Kyle Connor on the left wing with Mark Shifley. Guess what? If this team is going to win, both of those guys are need, going to need to be really good. And both of them are going to need to play well. And both of them are going to need to raise their level of play in different areas um, than maybe at certain times in the regular season. So let's all hope that they can do that. But this is a deep team, and last night was a perfect example of it um, that you know everyone contributed in. And I mean, I will point back to much of our discourse about Logan Stanley earlier on this season. The amount of people that said this guy's never played in the NHL, bust pick. I mean, go down the list. I haven't heard much from those people lately. I mean, dare I say Logan Stanley's starting to be like an analytics favorite <laughs> with some of his performances right now, Reem? Um, listen, well, I- there's a lot of guys that are going to contribute. It's not going to be about one or two players we can all have our opinions on how the coach handles particular things or their line um, line management and all of that. We'll go from there. But last night's game, if you're a Jet fan, even if you've been like the most negative person around, watch that game back if you want. It should give you a little bit more hope and confidence that, you know what, this team can hang with some of the best teams in the league. And frankly, that's what a lot of other teams and a lot of other people elsewhere are thinking about the Winnipeg Jets. So it's just about playoff time. It's time to all be focused on the positive in the right direction. And I think get the hopes up for what might be available. And if they play that way, we'll be talking about it a lot more. I was going to mention, I talked about this yesterday with Scott Billick, who did a story on Logan Stanley, but are we in the middle of witnessing a Logan Stanley breakout um it feels like he's really playing to his size six foot seven and but he's always been really good at uh you know getting shots off getting pucks on net and you know if it was game one you know i think he's got the edge now he's really impressed he's dropped the gloves again playing physical uh and that's what you want to see from a guy they want him to use his size and be that tough defenseman to play against and he's certainly uh taking a, a lot of steps forward this season and he's played solid whenever he's been put in after, you know, being a healthy scratch for most of the first half of the season. Well, just recently, really. I mean, like, we were at the 60-game mark, and I think he played 15 games. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I, I, like many of us, were wondering, oh, maybe he's dealt at the trade deadline. It just doesn't look like he's really fit in. I mean, Nate Schmidt played all season long and played quite well. But to Stanley's credit, I don't know whether something he just finally got it, um, but something has changed. He's a more confident player, and he's doing the things that basically he was drafted to do, and that is be physical, be simple. You're not going out to win the Norris Trophy. You're going out there to have a good shift, to help your team defend, to get the puck out, move it to the guys who can make things happen, and he's been doing a good job with that. Stan Scott in chat, hey, it really is the nature of social media. Narratives get a bit out of control. And it is good as, you know, we've seen some pushback lately as well. Bottom line is this fan base and this group isn't big enough to be going at war with each other. Um, The last time I checked, which is right now, I look at the standings and the Jets are in fact in second place in the Central Division. Five points back of Dallas. Dallas basically just needs a win to clinch their uh, to clinch first place. Uh, they have the exact same record as the Colorado Avalanche, but have two more regulation wins. So if it ended the way if it goes into the way that it is right now, the Jets would have home ice. Oh, tomorrow's game, of course, is massive when it comes to that. Um, so I mean, whether they're at home or whether they're on the road. I mean, the Avs are far from a perfect team as well. Although you do look at that 38-1 and record at home and think oh, it sure would be nice to have the last change in Game 7 if it does go that far and uh, have Adam Lowry, going up against, uh, <laughs> Adam Lowry going up against Nathan McKinnon as opposed to giving Jared Bednar the last one, uh, the last change. 
No, listen, um, overall, though, and we'll get to this with Mike and certainly with Brandon, um, uh, you know, a, a game and a performance the Jets needed. Um, now it's time to do it again tomorrow against the Colorado Avalanche and most importantly, do it the following week when you play that team with your entire season and postseason on the line. Um, Rowicki's going to come on in a few minutes, but let's quickly hear what Bones had to say. Um, this is... Uh, uh, this was a, a win that he desperately wanted, I believe. He put together his basically his playoff lineup, it seems, with the exception of Gus in for Nino Niederreiter, and um, saw his team win 3 nothing. Here's what Bones had to say afterwards. Yeah, that was uh, that's the way we want to play the game, and um, you know that team's a great hockey team over there, obviously. And we had to, we knew we had to bring our A game on out there on every shift, and we did. Um, that's that's the way we want to play, and uh, we're gonna, uh, yeah. It's the uh, certainly that's the plan for that's the way that they want to, that the way we'll we'll play, um, but um, it, a confidence building win and and a sixty minute win. Um, and Nikolai Ehlers, speaking of players that have bounced back, I mean, they're, everyone will have moments where they're not at their best. Um, and I know the narrative has been some guys are maybe held accountable more than others. Um, call it however you see it. Nikolai Ehlers had a great game last night, a big goal, and Bones talked about him bouncing back from uh, some limited ice time in the game against Nashville when the coach didn't like it, what he was seeing. He wasn't happy with his game. We had a good talk this morning. And, um, yeah, he, he was really good. He, listen, he was good at both ends of the ice. You saw that back check in the second period. Like, that's that's just as impressive as the goal. So I thought he was had a really, really solid game at both ends of the ice. How important is it to have that ability to self-assess when things don't go well? Obviously, puck management was one of the yeah. issues for the other day, and he's yeah. always been an guy. But he was ready to go tonight, and he's an honest guy. That's right. He is accountable, and he knows he wasn't at his best, and he takes great pride in that. So give him a lot of credit for a good bounce-back game. All right, there's Bones with uh, some praise for Nikolai Ehlers. Uh, he also talked about that line overall, along with Tyler Toffoli and Sean Monaghan. Uh, that that line, you know, earlier in the year when we had, the, or earlier when we got uh, Tyler, that was they were scoring a goal a game, and then Tyler got sick that one game, and things happen, right? But that line has been very good at both ends of the ice. Uh, Sean and Tyler have been good fits for what we're doing here, and Nick seems to fit really well with that line, so it's a good look. All right, there's Bones um, on the uh, on the line now. Lauren Brassois. I mean, the Jets have been benefited from great goaltending all year long, and they are not in this position in the standings, and we are not having these conversations right now about a Jennings trophy. There's a lot of credit deserved to the coaching staff and the team, but the last line of defense is, um, well, <laughs> a lot of teams have figured out how important it was this year. Hellebuck was the man stealing two in Nashville. LB was awesome last night part of a great uh, a great performance and that logan stanley that we talked about before uh, along with dylan sandberg had a real strong game as well here's bones what you know, bones had to say about uh, lb as well as the third defense pairing outstanding yeah you, know, you talk to me again timely saves when we needed them uh, we didn't give up a lot of great a's tonight but when we did he was there he's been he's been so good for us this year he's been he's been outstanding what did you see from your third pairing so you looked like another solid game? Yeah, they were really good. Uh, they got caught on the one. Uh, we turned the puck over the full line. They got caught. But other than that, they were solid. They're moving the puck. They're doing their job. They're playing physical. They're moving the puck, and they're taking care of our zone. Did you think that was intentional, or was it more of an accidental play on Sanford on the back? Uh, it was kind of accidental, but it's going to be called. You, you slide into the post and knock it off. And it's... All right, one more from Bones. Um, just talked about the fight for second place and this huge tilt tomorrow in Denver against the Avalanche. We knew the importance of tonight's game, and we know the importance of Saturday game. We'll be ready. And what did you see from Kyle and Mark today? Uh, yeah, they were solid, both ends of the ice. Everyone was. Just a quick one about Adam, uh, 700th game. Yeah, good for him and Nick got his 200th goal, and Adam's been outstanding for us all year, both ends of the ice. He's been a great captain for us, so very happy for him. It's uh, 700 games, and he's got a lot more in front of him. All right, so there's Rick Bonus. Um, as we mentioned, 700 for Adam Lowry and 200 goals for Nikolai Ehlers, all in a Winnipeg Jets jersey. We'll hear a little bit from Ehlers and LB later on. Uh, Brandon Rewicki, though, coming up in just a second to uh, continue our Jets talk here on WST. 
Well, spring is just about here, gang, and our friends at Consolidated Supply are ready for a very busy spring and summer and the change of the seasons. You know the gang at Consolidated Supply are the leaders in irrigation systems, artificial turf, and of course, golf carts in Manitoba is the official club car dealer with incredible new and used options for you in regards to golf carts. They've also got other amazing options for your property, including hot tubs and incredible outdoor kitchens. And of course, they're also the leaders in small engine parts and repair. Consolidated Supply has so much waiting for you. Come on down and see them at their beautiful showroom, open to the public at 1395 Niagara Road East, or find out everything Consolidated Supply can do for you online at cte.ca. Our friends at Manitoba Battery are enjoying the beauty of their new location over on Dovercourt Road. It is officially open, and Donnie and his staff welcome you down at the original location at 1026 Logan, but at the new spot at 452 Dovercourt Drive. And as part of the grand opening celebrations, any battery that's normally $60 or more will save you an extra $10 if you pick it up in store. But, of course, you know Manitoba Battery is your local option with the best prices on batteries of all makes, models, shapes, sizes, whatever you need, beating the pants off the big box stores. And, of course, they will deliver to you for free any battery purchase inside the perimeter of Winnipeg over 60 bucks. It's just that easy. So head on over to ManitobaBattery.com or pop by and visit the fellas at the new location, 452 Dovercourt Drive, and of course, the original spot at 1026 Logan Avenue. Guys, if you need to uh, get a fresh new look as we head into spring, you know where to do that. Get on over to one of the eight Modern Man Barber Shops, conveniently located throughout the city of Winnipeg, including their two newest standalone locations on Pemina Highway or on Plessy Road. Modern Man Barbershops offer a variety of grooming services, including haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more. The easiest way to make an appointment and book your look is at modernmanbarber.com. Make sure to give them a follow on Instagram as well, at Modern Man Barbershops. And we'd also have a huge thank you to the great people at Canadian Club for their continued support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. And of course... The Winnipeg Blue Bombers is the official spirit of the blue and gold. We'll be counting down the days till we're enjoying CC's at the Rum Hut and the Jim Beam Social House and CC's and Ginger's at the stands at Princess Auto Stadium. But while we wait for football to return, you can always get the great taste of Canadian Club and all their amazing products at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. Pop by today and check out the Canadian Club display. And remember... Always enjoy responsibly. All right, let's uh, let's welcome in here. Come on in here, Brandon. You just got a brand new haircut. Joins us in the WST studio, Brandon Rewicki, the host of Skates and Plates. Uh, looking good, and I'd imagine feeling good as well. Uh, like the players, uh, the fans, everyone, I think, probably needed that win. Uh, certainly needed the win, but it was the performance of the win that... Um, maybe allows us to get a little bit more excited for the playoffs. Like I think everyone should be after a season that has them with more regulation wins than any other team in the NHL. Yeah. The place looks great, by the way, I'm loving it in here. So <laughs> I appreciate you nice and cozy. So uh, I'm, I'm loving the studio. It's looking great. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think to just have a night where we don't have to talk about line combination, this and top line that and bottom pair, this and who's scratch. It's just, instead, what we witnessed was, in my opinion, it, it's got to be for sure one of the three best games they played this season. I, If you want to tell me it's the best game they played, considering the opponent and everything, I, I wouldn't argue too much about that. That was, it was, it was clinical. It, it, it was a masterful performance by the team. I love it because there's no, there were no passengers. We can't even look at, like, watch the game and say, who, who really had a stinker? Like, I, I don't know. It was... One through 18, every one of those skaters, and then LB playing like a Vesta candidate. I mean, he's he's as good as any goalie in the league right now, which is crazy when the guy ahead of him is the the presumptive Vesna winner. So that it was just a nice performance, one, just to kind of push some of the negativity of the past handful of weeks aside. 
But on a really a more impo- important note now, I mean, first or home ice advantage in the first round is completely on the table and graspable, depending on what happens against the the Avalanche there on Saturday afternoon. But I mean, it's not totally inconceivable that first of the division is off the table either, because Dallas has only got two games left and. Maybe a brief little slide for them when the games don't matter too much for them, right? So they, there's still a lot to play for. Uh, and so, I mean, every single way you look at it, that game was mandatory victory for the Jets, and they came through it a huge way. Well, the the, uh, the funny thing is, let's just take a quick look. Dallas, I believe, finishes their final two games of the season against the – oh, no, they've got Seattle and St. Louis. Uh, they play on Saturday, and then they play on Wednesday against the Blues. And, and it's still possible. The Blues have a huge game tonight at yep. home as underdogs against Carolina. Um, with the win, they could get within one point of a wild card spot. Now, they still would not have the games in hand. Um, and listen, we'll get to Vegas in a minute. <laughs> Um, who hasn't looked great, but might be getting some extra help uh, coming in earlier than many people threw out there. Um, but when you think about the Dallas, I, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they're going to get a win and be that to be that team. But tomorrow's game, Brandon, um, and we'll get back to LB and, and whatnot in a second. Like, the more I think about this, and again, this maybe does go a little bit to, you know, the strengths of the Jets as a deep team as opposed to the Avalanche as a more top-heavy team. I think having home ice against the Avalanche would be more of a benefit to the Jets than if they were playing almost any other team because of the ability for Bones to focus on the Lowry line. If you do go to a game seven, you you have that line going up with the preferable matchup more often than not than having Jared Bednar get his preferred matchup, which usually in most cases would be a best on best with McKinnon's line going up against Scheif. Yeah, you know, I've been I've been wondering about that. And I, I, I don't know. I kind of go back and forth a little bit. Like there's part of me where getting Lowry out there as much as possible would be great. But then there's another part of you that's like, I don't know. Sometimes the line matching hasn't really gone in the Jets' favor. So you almost want them to be on the road a little bit. So they're not like the, the utmost focus is chasing those matchups. I don't know. It, it, I'll tell you what. Not it, a bad point. It, you want home ice as long as you're winning those matchups. But if the matchup you're throwing out there against McKinnon isn't working like it hasn't for 99% of the season so far, then all of a sudden things get a little dicey. I, I think, honestly, for me, first and foremost, I think it's imperative for the Jets to get home ice just from a financial perspective. Like almost guaranteeing, assuming they you know don't get swept, like guaranteeing three home playoff games, like every little bit helps right now. And then the potential to, you know, grab a few more in the next round. But, I mean, look, Dallas has been great this year, but it would also be no insane upset if they played Vegas, for example, that they get out in round one, then all of a sudden the Jets find themselves with home ice advantage in round two as well. So, like, that, 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 there's that part of it for me. But I, I would probably, if, if I had to pick one or the other, I, I, would, I would rather have the matchups just because it's not even necessarily who I want out there against – McKinnon, because I just don't know if there's a great answer right now for that. But it would be more so you have the ultimate ability, whoever's on that second line, to feast on Colorado's third and fourth line. Like to have to to solely have that option there, I, I think that's the bigger one as opposed to we get our prime preferred matchup out there against McKinnon because there, there, there's a lot of just hoping and praying uh, against Nate Dog this year. So I, I, I'm not totally convinced there's an answer out there that any team has to slow him down. Um, but I think the ability to get that second line out there against the third and fourth and, and the second and third pairs of Colorado, that's, that's the bread and butter, and that's the primary reason Jets fans should be hoping for home ice in game one. You know, it's funny, and again, the schedule is weird every year, um, you know, with the number of games to be played, but these teams have only played head-to-head twice so far this season. The Jets had a big uh, 6-2 win at home, and I think back to that 4-2 win the Jets had in Colorado earlier this year as another one of those games that really stood out. But what also stood out was the way 
that some of the top players have stepped up. And listen, you know, there's been ups and downs. The top line has had some major issues at times holding their own in whatever respective matchups. But here's the thing. There is no scenario that the Jets are able to win without those top guys stepping up, being their best at playoff time. And, uh, you know, you have to just hope that that happens. But it has happened in the past. And I'll tell you what, I think that it's not lost upon the team. Because we heard it quite a bit, Brandon. You know, certainly after the game in Nashville that they won and were sort of, you know, <laughs> meek about it because knowing that they probably didn't deserve it and that's not a way to win. Um, but also, I'll give Jacob Stoller credit. I mean, he did a thing, you know, we all heard somebody, uh, you know, refer to the team as frauds and talk to Adam Lowry and talk to Josh Morrissey about it. Um, this isn't a team that is ignoring the ups and the downs that they've been th- this year. And and I'll say this, and again, it's one game, but it really did seem like they responded last night in a matchup against a team they had not beaten that so far is the measuring stick in the Western Conference with a performance that they had done numerous times before at the exact perfect time. And um, you just have to hope that that could be a bit of a, 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 I don't want to say a starting point, but a building block of the framework of a way it gives you the best chance to win and leaning on every member of a deep team as opposed to one line to make or break a matchup. Yeah, and especially, you know, if you're going up against Colorado, they well have the depth aspect of that 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 matchup tilted in their favor, right? Um, but I, I totally, I mean, that was a throwback to the first half of the year, right? Where that, that was the team. You weren't saying frauds during the first half of the year, I'll tell you that much. Um, I mean, if they play like that, and then that's why the, the, the ability to snap that losing streak when they did was so critical because there was just enough runway for them to potentially get everything sorted out and then carry momentum, carry, you know, how they were supposed to be playing into the postseason. And then you have yourself feeling good about, you know, where things are at after game 82. If they tried to figure it out tomorrow afternoon for the first time, then it's alarm bells. But the fact that they were able to stem the bleeding a little while back was just that to, to me, that was so massive. And then now you have, a pretty unique scenario going into this game against Colorado. It kind of reminds me a little bit, Huss, of when the New York Giants would play the Patriots at the end of the season. In a game that, you know, standings-wise, there's a lot more at stake in this one, right? But, like, ultimately a game that that didn't mean a whole lot in in the macro sense. But the Giants would come into it and be like, we don't care. Like, we want to we wanna kick your ass. And that, that's how I think Winnipeg should look at this game against Colorado here, where like you've got a, a pretty damn good opportunity that I mean, not only set the tone, but I mean, you want to see, you want to put a lot on that top line that's had so much animosity thrown their way. Hey, give us a reason why we should throw you out there for game one of the playoffs, or give us a reason why why we should split it up. Right? Same goes, you know, second pairing and, and go all over the place where. Where, where, where Jets fans have had their biggest gripes this year. Like, it, it, it's kind of an opportunity for the players themselves to make their case to Bones that, hey, this is what the lineup should look like for game one of the postseason. So I, I'm not necessarily concerned about the result itself, but more so just the performance from some key spots in the lineup here because you never want to put too much in one game, but at the same time, Huss. I, I kind of might if if we get either some negative or, or some positive answers on some of the question marks in this lineup. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I, I'd rather win game one of the playoffs than tomorrow. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> but we'll be on the air on Monday breaking this one down as if it was game one of the playoffs. Yeah. And that's just, I mean, I guess the nature of um, of this space each and every day. Um, but you know, let's talk about the blue line for a minute. I, Josh Morrissey was so good last night. And, and and as much as most of the team wasn't there in Nashville, um, and again, I was in the building, so maybe you get a little bit of a different experience watching it there as opposed to on TV. But I thought he was outside of Hellebuck, who was in a whole nother stratosphere, the best jet right now. Um, he, he is at a level, Brandon, that I would offer is maybe – ahead of where he was last season. I know the points haven't quite been there. Um, And he's going to be playing a ton, as we know. Um, 
The big concern, I think, for me has been more around the second pairing and Neil Pionk. Um, because I'll be honest, the third pairing right now, and this would have sounded crazy two months ago, talking about the way Logan Stanley's played with Dylan Sandberg on the offside. Um, those guys have just been steady, solid, confident, um, and it really has changed the equation. And Pionga in particular, just because he plays on that second pairing, he plays so many minutes, is crucial that he improves. I mean, maybe not gets back to the best that he's been, if that might be unrealistic, but I do wonder if he can raise his level of play from some serious struggles over the course of the past month. Um, and, and I guess if we're trying to be positive, I remember him last year. Yeah, same thing. I mean, that's exactly what he did against the Vegas Golden Knights. Josh Morrissey went out and he played his ass off. I think he led the team in scoring with seven points in five games and left it all on the line. There will be mistakes, but I mean, there were some mistakes last night. The rest of the team was there to bail them out. And if the rest of your teammates can cover for you the way that they did against Dallas, albeit not making very many, that gives you the blueprint to really come together and be the team that we saw limit teams to low shots and low goal, to- goal totals for so much of the season. Yeah, and it was it was kind of around, like, I, I don't know if it was the second last game of the year or the third last, but it was that matchup against the Wild. Uh, the, the the one that ended up going completely crazy at the end of last season that was kind of the turnaround for Neil Pion, right? And then I, I totally agree that in, in the playoffs against Vegas, he was he was one of their best skaters, never mind blue liners. Like yeah. he was, he, th- I, I think that's why the team has been so patient and maybe so reluctant to demote him or remove him out of the lineup is because they know that like when he's on, He's a good player, but he just we just haven't seen that guy for quite some time. So, look, if, if he's banged up right now, to me the easy answer is get him out of the lineup and let him rest for a week and a half and have him as, as close to 100% as you can possibly get him right now. Um, I mean, on top of it, too, you get a bit of a peak look if you, know, you want to keep that third pair together at maybe what Dylan and, and Miller could look like if you need to go that route come playoff time. Um, but I, I think I, I've said this all along, Hus, that I get the sense that the Jets coaching staff and Bones believe that the Jets' best chance at success is having a fully focused, ready-to-go Neil Pionk in their decor. And and that's why they've been trying and trying and trying to get his game going here. Yeah, they're trying to build his confidence up. But I think when we saw him play with Josh Morrissey, that was what. You could have gone one of yeah. two ways. It's not like they haven't been watching the struggles. They figured they got this much time to try to get him back up there. And listen, I'll say this, and I know we haven't seen it at all during the regular season, and this goes for flip-flopping guys on the top line with Ehlers and Connor. I mean, if it's going really poorly, I don't believe they just stick in their, their heads in the sand and ride with that until they're out. I think they do change things, but they are trying to work um, and and – make that group that they believe gives them the best chance to win. That's their decision, their prerogative to do it, the best chance to start off well and be that team. But, I mean, it it would be insane to lose or have those guys, you know, have similar things that have happened from more recent history repeat itself and not do anything to change. And and I think that the amount of guys, whether it's Miller, whether it's Nate Schmidt, um, guys like David Gustafson with what he did last night, there are other players that are there that I think through their play have said, hey, we're ready to go if needed, and we'd love the opportunity. Well, and that's the thing. And I guess the the, the question or concern that comes with that is, you know, how, how ready are the Jets coaching staff – going to be to, to pull the plug or to adapt or to try to change things because they've been pretty rigid in terms of the structure, like shockingly consistently. That's fair. That's fair. It, like, we, we know bone like top six checking third line, the fourth line as is built right now. Like that's how the team looks up front. The D pairs outside of the third pair have not changed all season long. So I, I just wonder that if these struggles continue, are they going to be willing to make the big move and, and possibly shake things up if necessary? Because to me, Hus, if you start game one against Colorado and we get the same Neil Pionk that we've gotten for the last, let's say, month, two months of the season, you, you, you can't wait anymore. Like you can't play the patient game. You're running out of time at this point, and it's such a pivotal position that for me, it's got to be a quick hook 
and it can't just be a demotion. It's got to be we're, we're going to Miller or we're going to Schmidt, and we need you to sit out, and 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 we see if that revives thing, gets your game back, and then maybe the decor is a little sharper. I just I I, I wonder. I, I don't know if I would say that I I don't think they will. I we just I just don't really know because they've been so stringent on on keeping this structure and and, and the team as is for almost the whole year. Well, I mean, much like, you know, finally at the end of that six gamer, um, you know, they swap the lines. I mean, I think that happens in a much quicker fashion because you don't have six games to to kind of figure it out. Um, but as I said, it'll be something we'll watch. Hey, hopefully we don't have to even have that conversation because things go well. So much of it, I think, and we can talk about the wingers, but Mark Shifley, um, you know, e- even even as of late, I think has had – some sneaky good games doing, you know, everything you need to, you know, compete against the guys like McKinnon. We've seen him in the past raise his level of play. We talked about the game against the Rangers where he sort of took over. I mean, to me, and I know we had that series against the Edmonton Oilers that was the closest sweep of all time. But to me, with Mark Shifley in his prime right now, for a lot of reasons, Brandon, I think this might be this upcoming series, not really tomorrow's game, the biggest challenge of his career. Um, you know, being a leader for a team thought of as certainly second in the matchups of the top centers um, with the ability to go and make a real statement for himself and his team against Colorado. Well, and I think how bonkers his recent playoff history has been. <laughs> like, nuts <laughs> just like i don't know if he like if he if he tripped over some kind of bad luck like did he break a mirror and walk under a ladder but like what is it three three post seasons that he's been out with injury a fourth with suspension he, he just hasn't really had things go his and way injuries for a guy that is so durable for the most part during the regular season like has barely missed and, any time in the regular free season injuries Right? Like a, a skate to the back of your leg. You get tripped on a breakaway. Right? Like just it's a b- bizarre. It's been very bizarre for him postseason wise. And it kind of overshadows the fact that, like you said, he's when the chips are down, he's been very productive. And he has been a difference maker for the Jets in postseason time. It's just been such a, a bizarre stretch that we haven't seen him play more than a handful of games in a row. So I, I mean, look, there's no doubt about it. Hellebuck your most important player, your best player. Morrissey at this point has transcended his game to become the best skater on the team. It's up to Mark Shifley to, to battle Josh Morrissey for that crown. If, if he's anything less than that, it's going to be tough to get past Colorado, let alone go deep, right? So it, to, to me, it's almost to the point where I don't, I don't care who your wingers are. Just elevate your game and, and let's try to elevate the guys around you and, and, and be... You know, you want to go down the Stevie Y route that everybody talks about. You know, like let, let's let's take that game to another level here. Whether it's Connor, whether it's Ehlers, whether it's Filardi, whether it's Defoli, Perfetti, whoever it might be. I, I I think we can see that guy. And even that game against Nashville has like yes, the team got horrendously dominated and outplayed. But I, I loved his engagement level and and his interest level in that game. Like and, and that that if you get that part of him there then that's when the best of Mark Shifley comes out. No and I, I've been pretty pleased with this game all year long, so I, I don't really have much reason to doubt that he's not going to be an impactful player for the Jets come playoff time. It's just going to be, is he going to be really good, or can he go from really good to amazing, outstanding, and go toe-to-toe with likely the MVP of the season? No doubt about it. Brandon Rowick is with us. Hey, Rue, before we go... Um... Uh, we're going to be doing Breezy Bend golf reports all week, weekend long for the Masters. Um, are we going to be watching some interesting golf on Sunday, or is this going to be a coronation of Scotty Scheffler just sort of cruising down the back nine with a big lead, re- like just confirming what everyone already knew, that he's the best golfer on the planet right now in 2024? Well, I mean, it's not much of a prediction, but my my pre-Masters one was that Scotty hits 20 and nobody's all that close. Um, it, it, I, I, think it, I, I think it ends up that way. He's just on another level right now. And it's funny because Augusta, like the greens are so... <laughs> the, the greens are just on another level there. But I actually think, you know, having familiarity with the course and having one there mitigates 
his his putting issues. And so I yeah, I I, I thought he was gonna come in and, and light it on fire and he hasn't disappointed so far. I think the main thing on top of it too is you know, none of the big names, I know Bryson's been in there right now, but none of the guys inside the top 10 in world rankings are really doing a whole lot to push him right now. And that's, I, I would love to see, at least give us like a moving day where there's some drama. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not totally sure we're going to see a Sunday for the ages, but um, I'll, I'll be I'll be pretty shocked if, if Scotty isn't wearing green jacket number two by the time Sunday night rolls around. I agree. I mean, opened, I mean, pre-tournament plus 450 favorite, lowest that any event like this since Tiger Woods and yeah. uh, plus 150 right now. Uh, Bryson is at seven. Scotty's got to seven. Max Home is at six right now. Danny Willett, Danny Willett hadn't played a competitive round of golf since last September, had surgery, and he eagled eight. He's two off the lead right now what an incredible wow. story he was like 300 to one or something like that um and canadian cory connor's holding his own like the course playing really tough today up until this point i think two under is the best uh ludwig aberg's actually three under on his round to get to two under uh but Corey's looking good three under playing the ninth hole right now so we'll stay on top of that throughout the afternoon rue always great having you on the program enjoy the masters and the game tomorrow We'll talk to you next week, getting ready for the first round. Likely a best of seven between the two teams we're going to see play tomorrow in Denver. Beauty, yeah. I mean, it's it's on on the way to get my pistachios and cold ones for Saturday and Sunday afternoon. So I'm ready to go. Thanks for having me again. Looking forward to it. I, I'm trying to decide, too. Do we go 1919s or do we go generics from Little Brown Jug for the Masters weekend? Uh Good, good problems to have. I'll say that much. Uh, choice is always tough. Um, listen, we're going to have Mike McIntyre come up with us in a minute. We will hear from Nikolai Ehlers and um, uh, Lorraine Brassois as well. Jets are on the ice practicing in Denver. Uh, but first up, before we get to all of that, thanks to some great Winnipeg Sports Talk sponsors. I want to extend a huge thanks to the great people at Princess Auto for their support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Of course, Princess Auto proudly founded right here in Winnipeg and committed to Winnipeg with their headquarters, national headquarters right here, uh, not only supporting Winnipeg Sports Talk, but all of our local teams, including the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, as they welcome fans to Princess Auto Stadium this year to cheer on the blue and gold down at the U of M. Uh, Princess Auto, of course, is the place where you'll find the best deals on the most incredible and unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them in store on Panit Road or Portage Avenue West. And you can always shop online 24 7 365 at princessauto.com. Uh, we also want to thank the folks at Wallace and Wallace. Speaking of getting ready for spring, you know, Wallace and Wallace are the fencing and overhead door specialist. You'll see their fences and trucks all over the city. And for all of your fencing needs, Wallace and Wallace has you covered. What you might not know is that they're also the overhead door specialist in Winnipeg with the largest selection in Manitoba as the Clopay dealer here in town. They can also help you, though, with your maintenance, with the crazy weather, getting cold, getting warm again. This is the time to prevent downtime going into the new seasons. Give Wallace and Wallace a call to book your maintenance and inspection service call today for residential and commercial overhead door sales and service. There's only one name or two you need to know. That is Wallace and Wallace. And speaking of the change of the seasons, fellas, I think a lot of you may be looking into the closet and realize it might be time to up that menswear game well whether you need a suit for a particular event or just want to upgrade your uh, workwear and more f apparel is the spot um just an incredible selection of custom menswear waiting for you starting with suits beginning at 400 dollars along with chinos golf pants custom shirts both tucked and untucked styles 
and an amazing selection of menswear accessories. If you are getting married or in a wedding party coming up this summer, make sure to talk to the fellas at F about a 15% discount when the entire wedding party uh, gets your suits at F Apparel. They've also got great deals for high school grads as well, so make sure to talk to the guys at F about that. Um, pop by and see them, 190 Smith Street downtown. You can also find out more online or make an appointment at F. That's ephapparel.com. And as we look ahead... To spring and summer, I am counting down the days to fishing season. And you know on Winnipeg Sports, when we're talking fishing, we're getting fired up to head back to Aikens Lake Wilderness Lodge. One of a kind, incredible fly and fishing experience right here in Manitoba, where you can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg. And as incredible as the world-class fishing is that awaits guests at Aikens Lake, the hospitality of the Aikens team and the Turan family is even better. Head on over to AikensLake.com, find out more about everything available at Aikens coming up, and you can contact them as well about pricing and availability options and booking dates for the 2024 fishing season. AikensLake.com online, and make sure to check them out on all their social channels at Aikens Lake. All right, let's let's uh, let's go now to the side of the road on I-94, somewhere between the Twin Cities and Fargo, for our visit with Mike McIntyre of the Winnipeg Free Press, who is back from the Frozen Four, where the Michigan Wolverines and Jets' top prospect Rucker McGrory's season came to an end last night. Mike, thanks so much for taking the time and your dedication to <laughs> hooking up with us on WSD. So <clears throat> I have a rental car, Huss, and this is my first experience. You've probably had this, maybe Remo too. This is my first experience with the car that has the self-driving, feet, like the self-steering feature to it. It is the freakiest thing ever. Um, honestly, like between putting the car on cruise control and then steering control, you feel like you're just... You're a passenger well behind the wheel. Now, of course, you still got to have your hands at the ready. Uh, but it is it is freaky, the, the technology. And like I said, I'm sure there's others that have experiences out there. This is, I got a brand, kind of a, new, uh, a brand new Kia, a Kia Forte uh, 2024. It had 400 kilometers on it when I picked it up the other day. I'm going to be returning it tonight with a heck of a lot more on it. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's quite something. I have seen the future, and it is uh, it is impressive. Um, let's. Uh, and I could say that about Rucker McGrory as well, because I was I was there to watch the future. Speaking of seeing the future, well, first off, tell us about the game. Yeah. Um, I was sort of following it while we were uh, watching the Jets yeah. with the uh, performance. Well, a much needed big win. Everyone stepping in against Dallas. We've been talking about it for the last hour. How did things go for the uh, Wolverines in the uh, Final Four? Yeah, not so good. Uh, you know, they, they were in tough, um, you know, with with who they were facing last night. Boston College is absolutely loaded. Um, this is a team, and, and you know, their big guns certainly came to play. Two first-rounders from last year and another first-rounder from the year before in Cutter Goche, Will Smith and Gabe Perot, they were the first-rounders from last year. And those three, they were dominant last night. I, I think they combined for six, seven points in the 4 nothing win. They were in on every goal. And, you know, Michigan, like, they're a team that midway through the year, it, 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 they, were, they were a long shot to even really qualify for the, the tournament, let alone get to the Frozen Four. They had a real good run, and, and in the late, you know, second half, and a big part of that, Huss, was Rucker McGrory, a guy who don't forget this is a this is a guy that got stretchered off the ice in mid November, ended up missing almost two months of of college action. Um, part of that, of course, the World Juniors were going on, but he made it back for the World Juniors. Um, you know, I heard a lot about his injury this week and talking to him and family and friends and teammates. It's quite remarkable that he played. You know, was able to return when he did. 
And it also would have taken him some time to get back up to speed. But, you know, he was a big part of that push. Last night, though, uh, you know, they, they were, it was obvious they were the second best team on the ice. Um, goaltender for Boston played really well. Uh, Michigan actually outshot them. Uh, but the, the better quality chances were certainly um, going against Michigan. So they're done. They, they lose for nothing. Their season is over. The big question, of course, now on everybody's mind is whether Rucker McGrady's college career is over. And let me tell you, Huss, I've been in a lot of locker rooms after losses. That was a tough, tough scene. Like that scene last night in the Michigan room was unlike anything I've experienced before. First of all, these aren't millionaire athletes. These are still kids. A lot of them. Don't forget, a lot of these kids haven't been drafted. Um, they don't necessarily have, you know, an obvious next step. And so there's a bunch of seniors on that team. Like, that. that's probably their last big game of any kind that they're playing. So the way it works in college, uh, they open up the room 15 minutes after the game ends. But every And, and there's a 30-minute window where every player has to be available. That's very different than the NHL, where... You put in requests and they'll bring up by the time you get in the room, it's empty and they'll just bring out a couple of players. Not the case last night. And my goodness, that was like walking into a funeral. Um, every kid at their locker. This is now it would by the time we got in, it was more like 20, 25 minutes after the game. Every kid still in full gear. Gear is streaming down the faces of some of them red eyes, and absolute silence. And uh, so I, I made my way over to Rucker McGrody's stall, had a, a chat with him. I had had a really in-depth chat with him earlier in the week. Last night, obviously a little a little shorter. And Huss, like, this is a kid, and I think this is one of the qualities about him that folks are going to love. The passion, the, the caring, the character. Like, he was devastated. I'm talking like quivering lip, cracking voice on the cusp of tears. Um, and, you know, I, I know a lot of, you're probably going to ask me like, so is he signing with the Jets? I wish I had a, a direct answer for you today. Bottom line is I don't. Um, if, if you had to ask me which way I'm leaning, I think he will sign with the Jets. But there was certainly a sense of some unfinished business as well on the college end. And I do get the feeling, Haas, that this may be not just Rutgers' decision in the sense that what does he want to do? There may be a group decision going on here. There's a bunch of of, uh, of sophomore players, um, you know, with very bright futures, probably at the NHL level on that Michigan team. And you wonder if a bunch of them, are either going to, to decide that it's time to take the step or or do they try and run it back for one more year? They've been to the Frozen Four now two straight years and they've come up two wins short. One win short to get into the final and then winning the final, which would be the ultimate goal. Um, that being said, Rutger McGroarty and what he was talking last night, part of him sounded very reflective, almost as if he was mourning the end of his time at Michigan. Um, but, you know, if I had to tell you today, and I, I've spent a lot of time with his family and and whatnot, um, it's going to be a well-thought-out decision. The Jets have been in constant touch with them. They, they had a presence there last night. But they've also been respecting the playoff push. They've wanted to give him his space. I do think we'll hear his decision in the next few days. Um, and obviously, it's it's going to be a tough one because I think there's pros and cons on both sides of the coin for Rucker and for the Jets. Mike, just as far as Michigan goes, um, I mean, you mentioned that group of sophomores that have the ability to come back if they want. I mean, was there a heavy senior presence on that team? Um, you know, how different will that team look regardless of their decision? Um, I, I guess, I guess basically my point is if that group of players came back, would they be in a situation where, they would have a very good chance to maybe go that next step, or is it very much up in the air? They just know that there's a really good group of players in that similar situation that Rucker happens to be in. 
Well, the two line mates. It, so Rucker was playing on the top line with uh, with Gavin Brindley, who I believe is a Columbus draft pick. And Frank Nazar, who's a Chicago Blackhawks draft pick, they're both sophomores. So uh, those three, they're the core. They're the core right now. They would absolutely be the core next year. There are a bunch of seniors. One thing about Michigan, though, and again, talking to folks this week in, in Minnesota here, I mean, Michigan, because of who and what they are, they've won nine national titles, tied for the most all time. Um, They've got some real talent coming like they have no issues with recruiting uh high level players to kind of fill the holes that inevitably come up uh and so last year adam fantilli was a huge part of this team he's now with the blue jackets um but michigan still had a very good year even without fantilli so there's some really good players that are on the way i think you know so frank nazar is is an interesting uh, kid and I talked to him extensively him and Rucker have known each other since they were like little kids they played hockey at all levels together they were world junior teammates um, and now they're of course teammates on Michigan but they go all the way back to to honey baked in Michigan playing AAA together playing spring hockey together on like you know teams that that in fact traveled to Winnipeg when they were kids to play in the subway tournament um, and so Frank Nazari has been drafted by the Blackhawks um, Brindley, Nazar, and, and McGrory, they're their three top offensive players. And, you know, you wonder, like, if one goes, do all three go? Or, do, you know, do all three get together? And so I think there's a part of that for sure that that they're going to be weighing. Um, and, you know, I will say this. I've seen a lot of people that are concerned that what if Rucker McGrory doesn't sign at all? What if he... What if he just stays in college and and what if he doesn't want to play for the Jets? Um, I've got an extensive feature that's coming in tomorrow's paper. It'll be online tonight that that talk to like his entire village, all the people that have played meaningful roles in his life and career. I, I sat in the stands with his mom and dad for over half an hour during their practice the other day. The family could not think more highly of the Jets and the Jets organization. I also talked to Jimmy Roy with the Jets, who was at the game yesterday. There is a tremendous relationship. As Rucker McGrady himself told me, um, the relationship is in a a great place with the Jets. Um, They've, you know, Kevin Sheveldayoff, Larry Simmons were at his playoff games a couple weeks ago. Jimmy Roy was there the day he got stretchered off the ice in November and stayed with the family. Mark Chipman has had all kinds of involvement. The Jets know that Rucker McGrady is special. And Rucker McGrory, as I outline in my piece, for a lot of reasons, he is the very type of player that, and Winnipeg, I think, is the type of market that's going to be perfect for him to excel on and off the ice. So I I have no concerns that Rucker McGrory isn't going to be a Jet at some point. Is it going to be in the next few days? As I say, I don't know the answer to that. I would be more confident in saying he's going to sign had they won last night and then gone on to win the final tomorrow. At that point, you're like, what what more would there to be for sure there to be to accomplish that sense? And again, it was very evident in in that room last night. This loss absolutely devastated these kids. If they feel they have a chance to, to take one more shot at it as a core, is that is that more lucrative than jumping into the NHL right now? And and again, a kid like Rucker, he's not under any illusions that anything's going to be handed to him. You know, so if if he's thinking, oh, I might have to go play a little bit with the Moose next year and wait for an opportunity, is it more enticing to try and run it back? And again, I don't know the answer. I think these are questions that they're, they will be debating here in the next few days. Well, absolutely. And, and, and listen, I mean, I've paid quite a bit of attention uh, bit of attention to the Michigan team, um, you know, paying attention to, you know, like their, that school and particularly their hockey programs did a great job with their, you know, their social media program. And, yep. and you know, I mean, we've had Rutger on, you know, a couple times on the program over the course of this year. And it, it does seem like he was absolutely loving every minute of being a Michigan Wolverine to being a member of that team. Um, 
and, and it won't be an easy decision for some players. They're there. When can I get to the NHL? That's what I'm here right. for moving on. I, 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 I do agree that I think there's a lot that will come into this and um, that's why it might take a little bit of time, but let's just say this decision is, let's just say he decides, you know what? Tough loss, had a great run here. I'm going to turn pro. What would that mean in the short term? Um, does he become a black ace and just get some, the NHL atmosphere he gets to be here in Winnipeg and see what the city's like in and around the whiteout and get that. Is there potential they do? I guess they'd have to do an ATO yeah. to play with the moose come Calder moose. cup playoffs. Um, I, I mean, that's probably not anything you talked about with him, but just in your mind yeah. with where he's at right now, if he was going to sign or decide I'm turning pro, um, how does that look like? Yeah, I mean, there there would be a potential financial incentive right away. Like, if he signed his ELC with the Jets right now, um, I believe that he'd be eligible for a signing bonus. Like, like so he could cash in, you know, a, a, a bit of a payday here right now. But, you know, I get the sense this isn't about the money. There's there's a lot more at play than that. Um, and if you're Rucker McGrory, like, you're looking at the landscape of the Jets right now, I mean, you're you're looking, for example, last night, Cole Perfetti, who is is a first round draft pick like Rucker McGrory of the Winnipeg Jets. Cole Perfetti is what's he up to? 16, 17 goals now with the Jets and almost, you know, 30 plus points. He wasn't even in the lineup last night because the Jets are deep at forward. Um, and I know there's a lot of people excited, and they should be excited. Everybody should be very excited about what, what Rucker McGrody is going to bring to the Jets. But I think, you know, you got to pump the brakes a little bit. I see no, I see absolutely no situation where the Jets, given what's left in front of them now, they only have two home games next week, which may or may not mean anything. They may still be fighting for home ice, maybe not. But then they're jumping right into a playoff series and are they going to throw Rucker McGrory in ahead of Cole Perfetti, who's probably not even going to be in game one in the lineup? Uh, no, they're not. So, yes, there'd be great experience to be around that. Um, you could see how disappointed Rucker was with how things ended last night. This would be a chance to get him in a, obviously, a different environment, you know, and, and really, really bring him into that world. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the Moose would, would absolutely be an option, as you mentioned, sort of an ATO where, and then you could defer signing the, the full contract to next season. Um, and the Moose look like, you know, then Colby Barlow, for example, who's now on the Moose on an ATO, uh, Colby Barlow and Rucker McGrory have become terrific friends. Rucker just told me the other day how as soon as Colby Barlow's junior season ended and he joined the Moose, he was like the first one to call him. He said they've been in touch all year. Um, there's a lot of connections. It, it's actually eerie how many connections Rucker McGrory has to Manitoba. I mentioned that as a kid, he was coming up from Nebraska to play spring hockey in Winnipeg. One of the things I found out researching this story, Huss, this week, one of his first spring hockey coaches was Neil Pionk's dad. Um, Neil Pionk's dad put a team together when Rucker was like eight or nine years old. Uh, and so he, he's got a relationship with the Pionk family. Uh, he played as a teenager, he played hockey, spring hockey with Vlad Nemesikov's younger brother. Um, there's just, there's a whole bunch of, of interesting connections. Dom Divinchitis was lived with the family uh, for a number of years uh, um, when they were kids. So there's just a lot of connections there. And as I say, it goes back to that. I don't think anyone should be concerned that he's um, that he's not going to sign with the Jets. Um, I just There's a lot for him to consider right now. And, and the big question, and I don't know the answer to this, how quickly is he going to make that decision? Because, you know, given what I saw in that room last night, like this was not a kid that, immediately was going to turn his mind to what's next he was going to he was going to spend some time with this loss and 
you know, I, I asked him like, so what's next immediately? And he said, he's going to spend a couple of days, spend the next couple of days with the guys, AKA his teammates who are, you know, his brothers, as he called them. Um, and I think I'm sure there'll be some discussion amongst those players, especially the NHL drafted guys who still have eligibility to return about what they're all going to be doing. And that may ultimately factor into it. Mike McIntyre with us uh, en route from the Frozen Four back to the Not peg. actually driving right now. Via Trader out. Joe's. Well, no, it's his yeah. autom- automatic drive, automatic drive <laughs> car. Um, yeah. uh, listen, I mean, I know you were probably occupied last night and missed last night. I was night's watching game. the Jets game. I, I multitasked us. I had the, I had the, I literally had an eye on both the present and the future because I had my laptop. I think I posted a picture on Twitter or X as we now call it. I had the uh I had the laptop with the Jets game going. And then so I kind of had one eye on that while I was watching Rucker McGrady on the ice below at XL. Uh, so I did get to see the uh basically the majority of the Jets game last night. And yeah, that was uh that was mighty impressive. You know, a couple of people said to me, oh game didn't mean anything to Dallas. Take take a win with a grain of didn't mean anything to Dallas. Huh. It, they would have clinched first, not only in the division, they would have clinched first in the West, which would guarantee them home ice, not just through the first round, but also the second and the third. And, oh, the Rangers lot, they're they're right there for the President's Trophy, which if Dallas were to make the cup final, you don't think they want the series to start in Dallas and get home. So, you know, Get out of here with the that didn't mean anything to Dallas. They were the hottest team in the league, arguably the best team in the league. And you know, forget it, just the two points, obviously important for the Jets. The fact that they mothered a potent stars team that really has three lines that can just absolutely uh humble you if you're not on your game. The fact they held them to what 25 shots, I mean. Felt like the Jets gave up 25 shots just in the third period alone in Nashville the other night. I know they won both games, but that was night and day in terms of the effort and the execution. And it's, you know, that that's an important development for the Jets, Huss, um, to bottle that game last night. And, and, you know, the thing is, the playoffs start in just over a week. The Jets now, they have a template. They don't have to go back to two months ago. Hey, remember when we played whatever game, that great game two months ago? Let's get back to that. No, they can now say, remember when we had that great game just the other night in Dallas? Um, That's what we got to do to be successful. So it was uh, the result aside, it's it's the way that they got that win, which, uh, which was most impressive. Yeah, I uh, listen. I agree with you. I mean, the team needed it. The fans needed it. I mean, I was in the building in in Nashville, and while I mean, it's always exciting to see your team win on the road, and especially in overtime, the way that it happened with Kyle Connor doing it again in uh, in three on three. Um, you know, outside of the brilliance of Gabriel Velarde in that early goal and Mark Shifley as well, I mean, they were absolutely under siege for the better part of 40 minutes and listen it was the brilliance of Connor Hellebuck that got them that win Uh, and you heard from the players afterwards like hey listen that's not one that we're going to be putting up on the uh on the on the uh the top of the highlights uh list for the rear we know we need to be better and we will be better and they went out and were better and you know I think in a lot of ways with essentially the roster last night that we'll see in game one of the playoffs with the exception of David Gustafson, who was in for Nino Niederreiter, who will return to take his spot. Um, You know, overall, I mean, from one to 12 of the forward group, from one to six of the defense core, I I thought Sandberg and Stanley had a really, really strong game. And once again, I mean, the, um, you know, LB and net, it's, uh, that was something that they they can absolutely build on. He he probably just added another, you know, ten or twenty, thirty thousand dollars to his free agent contract that he's going to sign in the summer because, um, you know, he's he's certainly put the NHL on notice that he's ready to take on a bigger role than just the backup to the best in the planet in Connor Hellebuck. You mentioned Logan Stanley, Huss, and I feel like 
he deserves, and I'm sure you've touched on him on, on the show already. I feel like he deserves, I, I got to single him out anyways. This is a guy that a lot of people have dumped on. Um, there are there are people in this town who feel that he's not even an NHL caliber hockey player. Has Logan Stanley struggled at times? Absolutely. Has he been on the wrong end of some kind of ugly decisions and mistakes? Yes. Um, but I think we've seen a new and improved version of Logan Stanley, albeit in smaller doses this year. Um, but when he's gotten in the lineup, he's looked quicker. His decision-making has been better. And last night, that was that was Logan Stanley's, I, I would say, his best game in the NHL, period. Because you have to factor in who it was against. Um, and I, I believe when I looked at the final totals, he led the team in hits. He, or he, he might have ended up second. I think he had five hits. Led the team in shots. Led the team in shot attempts. Uh, was on the ice for the two even strength goals. No, he didn't factor in them. But analytics, he's on the darling, ice. Logan Stanley. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Two words you never would have thought you'd hear, along with Logan Stanley. Um, and to me, Haas, like I've thought that there's a place in Logan for Logan Stanley in the playoff lineup depending on the opponent. And, you know, if the Jets want to, if the Jets are playing a, a faster pace team and they want a little more speed, maybe in skill, maybe they think about whether or not he's in the lineup, but playing against kind of a heavier uh, team like Dallas, like, and na- he played in Nashville the other day too. Like he, he did not look out of place and that's a great sign. And, you know, one thing the Jets have going for them right now Uh, I know Cole Perfetti didn't play last night, but he certainly didn't look out of place in a top six role. I would almost view Cole Perfetti now going forward, Huss, as he's top six insurance for the Jets. Should somebody get injured or should they want to move some pieces around? And David Gustafson, who scores on his birthday yesterday, he's now, he's a solid bottom six insurance piece. And, you know, look at the role they put him in last night on that shutdown line with Lowry. And what a big night for him to to get a goal as he did. Uh, That line looked really good. And so, you know, the Jets, um, I know there's there's been some things that haven't gone all that great here in the last few weeks for the Jets. But uh, with with that effort last night and kind of the state of a few players games, um, along with the team as a whole, they've got three left to kind of get ready here, but um, they certainly seem to be trending in, in the right direction. Well, listen, I, you know, you, I mentioned that a little earlier today, and, and, you know, I mean, the combination of social media and whatever, the stuff that comes across your feed, I mean, you would think that, I mean, at a time that Logan Stanley, I'll put it this way, I haven't heard a lot of Mia culpas for the way the guy's played from a lot of people that absolutely, shit on this guy for a long long time and listen was he very good at times no was he a liability did he deserve to be on the lineup yes all of those things but we're so quick to brand somebody as this um right. you know what these listen did it take longer than i think a lot of people and even the organization would have hoped to be able to have the confidence to put him in in these scenarios yes but where we're at right now he has absolutely made the most of what probably was his real legitimate last chance. And he's played himself into a position that he is going to be in the playoff lineup, I believe. And that is not something that I could have imagined coming out of my mouth about two weeks ago, about two months ago. And I mean, the other thing that's kind of been dominating all of these conversations is, you know, obviously who will play left wing with Mark Shifley. And even for a night, um, and again, God knows I've talked about it. We've all talked about it a lot. It was nice to, to have the team remind everybody that this is more than two players, depending on what line they're going to be on, that's going to completely determine the fate of a club. Uh, this is a deep team that when you get to the playoffs, is going to need everybody playing at a high level. And is Ehlers going to be a factor? Is Kyle Connor going to be a factor? Mark Shifley, all those players, yes. But... Um, there's a lot of other guys that are going to be leaned upon in important situations to help this team win hockey games. And that one last night was something that he can certainly build on. Uh, and I think can maybe give the fan base a little bit of time not to make 
not to call the season over because yeah. of a certain line change that's happened as much as some of many of us might disagree with the premise of it um, and see what this team's capable of doing because we saw last night as presently constructed, even with the decisions that you may or may not agree with, the team's capable of beating the best teams in the National Hockey League as they've done throughout this year. The one final team they hadn't done was the Dallas Stars. They got yep. that done last night and perfect timing heading into well, three games from now, a time where you're going to probably be going up against Colorado, who will be uh, easily as much of a foe um, that uh, the Dallas has been and will be. Us, does that make Dallas the final boss for the Winnipeg Jets? Well, I think the Colorado <laughs> actually is. It's funny. I tweeted that out earlier today. I said this was the Central Division gauntlet. I mean, because, you know, listen, by a lot of the conversations, you would think this team was still in the middle of a six-game losing streak. That win last night made it five in a row. It made it three in a row on this central division gauntlet road trip we've been yeah. talking about pre-playoffs. And the final boss is Nate Dog, Nathan McKinnon. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there it yeah. is, the Colorado <laughs> Avalanche uh, Saturday <laughs> afternoon. Um, and then we get into, uh, I don't know, Hell in a Cell, uh, best of seven <laughs> against this team later on. I'm sure we'll have some good rest wrestling euphemisms. Maybe hey, I just... Just before we go, Mike, I know you're going to get back on the road. Um, did you get a chance to see WrestleMania? Oh. I actually got Kenny out in Nashville. We got together and had a great time. What did you think of uh, Cody finishing the story? And uh, the entire uh, thing was wild. So I, I, I freely admit I've seen all 40 WrestleManias. The majority of them like live as they happen, dating back to when I was a little kid, my my buddy, uh, his parents used to own a, a pizza joint on Henderson Highway. We used to go watch WrestleMania on the uh, the big screen in his parents' pizza place. And anyways, that 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 final night, the main event on Sunday, that was without a doubt my favorite WrestleMania main event. That was an absolute epic cluster it was nostalgia it was chaos i mean the only thing that stinks and i was reading about it yesterday i thought stone cold was going to be kind of the final the final run in and it sounds like that's what wwe wanted they couldn't i i assume stone cold was was demanding uh a, a lot of uh, a lot of money to get a lot of steve weisers or whatever he calls the beers that he that he chugs but they couldn't come to a financial deal, but the Undertaker was a nice. Uh, the Undertaker was a nice finale as One well. One of the loudest pops of all time, and when oh the gong went to think it down, I mean, and I listened to the guys from the McAfee show that were there, and a few other people that were in. They said they've never heard anything as loud as I mean, seventy-two thousand people oh. all screaming at the same time. It was, it was, it was amazing. It was incredible, and it was everything that is great about pro wrestling: great storytelling, great characters. Um, I, I just, I absolutely loved it. I did. I, uh, I'm 49, but I felt like a little kid, uh, watching that again. And, uh, I mean, credit, credit to the rock who like, I know a lot of people maybe think that, oh, he's not, not much of an actor. Like, first of all, he's one of the biggest stars in Hollywood for him to come back to wrestling all these years later and be so damn good at it. And I'm not just talking about like the way he wrestles like that's as anyone who follows that that's secondary. It's the story, the ability to talk him playing the bad guy. I mean, it, the final boss as, as he calls himself, like just tremendous character building, which made Cody Rhodes, you know, overcoming all these obstacles, even more sweet. It was, uh, it was just, it was fantastic. I loved every minute of it. And then I see, Huss, you were in Nashville. I see Morgan Wallen decided to break out a, a tables, ladders, and chairs match Dude, uh, across the street from you. Get this. So after, <laughs> after we went, uh, when we watched WrestleMania down at this DraftKings bar, it was still relatively, it was only like 9.30 or something like that right. in Nashville time when it was done. So... I figured walk around, have another couple beers. Um, so I went to Barstool, um, had opened up uh, Barstool Nashville. I thought, oh, we'll go check that out for a bit. I watched some of the Colorado Dallas game there. And then knowing that I had to figure out where I'm doing the show and a bunch of things, I'm like, I won't go full Nashville tonight. 
um, <laughs> I will start, you know, making my way back. And Ken had gone back to his hotel. I was with one of my other pals, and he was going to go meet up with some of the other gang that was down in Nashville for the game. And I walked back, and I, I, I don't have the picture to show you right now, but the bar stool bar, it like, okay, so there is Chiefs where Morgan Wellen happened yep. to this. The Barstool Bar, if you're looking at this thing, is on this cross street right there, maybe 150 meters to the right. So 930 got there, left about 12, 1040 or so. I walked by there at 1045. Wallen threw the chair at 1053. <laughs> I was literally there within 10 minutes of, I mean, and we all joking aside, um, He's so lucky that someone wasn't killed. I mean, that's that is a, yeah, a chair from that oh, height like that. <laughs> it it was, it was something else. And just so, so you know, chiefs now um, went there later on in, in the week. Uh, you go up to the top, great barbecue there, by the way, highly recommended. I guess this is Eric church's new place that only opened up last week. They've got all the tables, everything up there. Every table has four chairs except one has three. <laughs> I Are they think. bolted to the ground I, though? Uh, tell you what, I uh, well, that better not be something that people try to yeah. emulate because uh, he is just oh, absolutely boy. lucky, and he's got three felony charges waiting for him. So I anyway, know he was smiling in the cop car as he went and got his mugshot done, but that was yeah. uh, that was no joke. And the Jets were no joke last night. Cannot wait for this game tomorrow. Uh, Mike, travel safely. Thanks for the great yeah. conversation. We'll look forward to uh, catching up with you when uh, you get back to the peg and uh, one more week of regular season, and then it is playoff time. Betcha. Have a great weekend, Huss. Take care. Good stuff. There's Mike McIntyre from the Winnipeg Free Press. All right. We uh, still have a marble race to get to, as well as a... Uh, look into the master's leaderboard um as well as a quick check in with our friends at kids sport right now the first big thanks to uh, some wst sponsors making the show happen and as we get ready for the playoffs and the playoff excitement increases do not forget winnipeg jet fans that you can get priority access and count yourself in for the entire 2024 playoffs right now by putting down a deposit on season tickets or ticket packages for the upcoming 2024-2025 season. Head on over to winnipegjets.com slash deposit. A full list of the benefits of being a season ticket member or ticket package holder for the upcoming seasons there. Map and pricing and more. And if you do it now, you will be in the same seat for all of the whiteouts down at Canada Life Centre hopefully for a long and very fun playoff uh, playoff run for the Winnipeg Jets. Again, right now, the We're All In campaign continues. It's winnipegjets.com slash deposit for more on that. And while speaking of the playoffs, probably a trip down to Royal Sports is going to be necessary as everyone gets their whites ready for the Winnipeg Jets and whoever they're playing come April. There is simply no better sports store anywhere than Royal Sports. And if you're a Winnipeg Jet fan, thousands of pieces of Jets merchandise, white and otherwise, all of the jerseys, and still plenty of time to get your jersey customized with your favorite player, name, number, just in time for the postseason. So much more than just Jets merch as well, though, at Royal. Tons of bomber gear, Major League Baseball, with Jays starting up right now, NFL and more the biggest hockey section in town, all of the spring sports loading in by the day, and tons of cool stuff on the King Skate Snow and Surf side. Pop by and see it for yourself. Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway, and make sure to give them a follow on Instagram at Royal Sports Pemina for the latest merchandise drops and sale information. And speaking of those playoffs, I mean, if you're not in the building or the team is on the road, you know the best place to get together with your gang to watch the big game is your local Boston pizza. All the Jets games on the big screen with big sound, not to mention those ice-cold schooners, world-famous BP wings, gourmet pizzas, and some great new treats on the BP appetizer menu. There's simply nothing like getting together at your local BP. And if you are staying at home, though, you can get the great taste of Boston pizza by ordering online at bostonpizza.com. You train day in and day out. 
learning new techniques, approaching new concepts, and living out the thrill of achieving your goals. Building a craft beer is no different. While you spend your hours on the ice, we spend ours here, brewing our trademark beer. Again, again, and again. Here's to pushing the status quo and challenging ourselves to build something memorable. 1919 by Little Brown Jug. All right, it's time for another It Takes a Community to Play segment along with our friends at Sport Manitoba, proudly supported by Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries. And today we're welcoming in Dustin Ayer from Kids Sport Manitoba. Dustin, welcome to WST. It's great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great to sit down and chat with you guys. You know, I was really excited when uh, when Sam let us know that we were having you on to talk about Kids Sport and what you're doing in the community because... You know, of of many charities that you know are tightly connected to sports, um, this is one that has been around for a long time. Has had such a big impact. Uh, just before we talk about what's coming up and some exciting ways people can get involved in kids sport, fill us in a little bit on the background of kids sport and the mandate of it in, here in Manitoba and in Winnipeg. Yeah, for sure. So, like you said, kids sport's been around for a while. I think it's like 1998 is when it actually started out in BC and it's grown since then. Um, our mandate is really simple. Uh, all that we really want is for every kid in our province to have a chance to play sports. That's pure, that's simple, that's what it is. Um, last year in 2023, we funded grants totaling just under $550,000 to support 1,500 kids in our province. I mean, that is you know, significant. And it's not, you know, we often think, and listen, I'm sure hockey's a part of it, but, I mean, sport is not getting cheaper. <laughs> Nothing's really getting cheaper right now in uh, in today's day and age in 2024. But I would imagine that these grants, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about where the money comes from, sure. but, I mean, we are talking kids in every community um, and in a whole variety of sports as well. Yeah, and you know, like you mentioned hockey, and hockey's always going to be like near and dear to a Canadian's heart, but in all actuality, hockey is our fourth highest sport in, in Manitoba. We have more registrations in in, uh, in soccer, gymnastics, and football, and gymnastics is the, the highest, uh, the, the highest cost for sport, um, but we don't just fund like just kids born in Manitoba as well, right? Like we we fund grants for new Canadians coming over, and that's a large part of where soccer has such a high number. Well, and and, and to be honest, I mean, big picture, when you have people coming into new communities and new cultures, I mean, for young kids who are in a complete culture shock, potentially coming from elsewhere, like halfway around the world, I can't imagine a better way to start them feeling comfortable and integrating them in with their new peers than through through sports and and it really is like when we talk about um families so uh, uh over the last little while you're getting refugees that are coming in uh from from ukraine from various areas where um there's a lot of really hard news that are coming out of that um and you're getting families coming into communities all across like our our grants aren't just coming into Winnipeg, we're supporting 104 communities in Manitoba. And often a lot of these communities are taking on refugees as well. And so to get not just the kids, but but the parents involved in that community and, and show them what Canadians can really do and, and that we're really here, we want to help as much as possible. It's something that's really special. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in addition to what's happening around the world with the, uh, you know, the increased numbers of refugees that have had to move the, there's also a lot of canadians and younger and sing i think about what it would be to be a single mom right now with a young person that you know the young child that would you know really excited wants to play things but i mean they're just trying to make ends meet paycheck to paycheck i mean uh, I, I imagine where the people that you guys are touching goes across every cultural line uh and, and every area probably in this entire province and that's really true like I mean, you talk about like just trying to make ends meet. Um, the the statistic that we have is one in three Canadians. One in three Canadians can cannot afford to pay for sport. Um, in Manitoba, like we we take a look at all the different families that we support, and and you just never know. We we support families that uh, 
COVID was not great. Um, then all of a sudden inflation kind of comes in. There's just been a lot of things that are, are happening in around our communities that make it a little bit challenging for, for families. And then you will support families that, you know, just unfortunate circumstances come along. Mom or dad gets laid off from work or there's an illness or there's just, they're, they're going so, through some really difficult, challenging times. Um, we want those kids to still participate in sport. We want those kids to follow their dreams, follow their ambitions and, and keep continuing on that path. And so we're here to support them. You know, and now at kids sport, I mean, uh, crossing the 25 year barrier in uh, Canada and uh, certainly, uh, you know, a long time here in Manitoba, I, having been involved in other kids sport events, um, dinners, the, uh, the impact of this for people, I mean, it is probably one of the most rewarding parts of your job and, and probably a big reason why, um, so many, and we'll get to fundraising in a minute. So many mm -hmm. of the initiatives that are put forth continue to grow because people helping out a charity like Kids Sport, um, you find out the real impact of this and how important it is, um, both right now in the present for these young children that might not otherwise have an opportunity to play, but what it does for them in the long run. For sure, and you know we're we're pretty blessed. We work with a lot of different sport ambassadors. Like uh, Kids Sport has Nick Dembski as an ambassador, Desiree Scott, Tyson Langler. And uh, just recently, Chad Postmas. And one of the things that we're doing with a lot of our ambassadors is we're actually having kids sport camps, um, and and to see the kids interact with those athletes and stuff like that. It, it like it, just seeing them just playing is something that's just truly it, it's so special. It's it's just amazing, um, and you just want you just want that just to continue on, you know. Dustin, uh, Dustin here's with us from uh, from Kids Sport Manitoba now. Uh, with all these programs and uh, and so much need, um, there's increased pressure on fundraising. First of all, where does all the money come from? Like, I mean, uh, when you guys are talking about over a half a million dollars to help children play, um, where where is it all coming from? Well, you know, we are like we're very privileged. Canada Life is our provincial sponsor, um, and they 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 give us a lot of they give us a a, a significant amount each year to kind of run our administrative costs and stuff like that. So a lot of the fundraising that we do do, um, we're able to put that directly back into the community. So we don't have to really worry about that administration piece. Sport Manitoba also kind of takes care, uh, helps us take care of those things here. Um, but the large bulk of the money, uh, Andrew, um, is through fundraising. It, it comes from from fundraising events and and that's what we're really trying to drive. Sponsorships, uh, Under Armour is another proud sponsor that we have. It's a national sponsor um, and we do in-store events with them. They're very, very good to us. Um, but again, a lot of what we do, it, it's going to come strictly from fundraising. Well, and, and listen, I'm sure there's many people that are listening here that have been involved in making a donation, playing in a golf tournament, going to a dinner, uh, which leads us to a very important time of year for you guys, for a kids sport overall, and that is the kickoff for kids sport that uh, really pre-registration begins in earnest next week. Fill us in on uh, what's going on in the next uh, month and a half for a kids sport and how Winnipeg sports talk listeners can uh, help out or be involved. Absolutely. Again, we're, we're very, very fortunate uh, to have uh, the Winnipeg blue bombers as our football champion. And along with the Winnipeg blue bombers each year, we run a fundraising event. It's a peer to peer fundraising event that's open to all Manitobans to enroll in. Um, and it's one of our primary fundraisers each year. Um, it's a it's an event unlike any other. Uh, what we're looking for is for individuals, teams. Uh, this is the first year we're actually introducing teams into the format um, to go into their communities to raise money. Uh, one of the coolest parts about this, and, and we'll talk maybe a bit about it, but is the on-field experience. So people who enroll are top five fundraisers. The teams or individuals that raise the most money, the top five, will be invited to go onto the field on May 31st to compete in the Kickoff for Kids Sport Field Goal Challenge. It's an amazing event, and it's it gives me chills just talking about it. I mean, that is, listen, I got to give so much credit to the Bombers and yeah. Nick Dembski is one of our guys. I mean, a hometown guy. I know he was just up north on a, on a program in the last couple of weeks. Um, but this is, I mean, listen, from your perspective, and I mean, anyone that's been involved in organizations like this knows that 
I mean, you're totally dependent on the involvement of the community and people being there, realizing the good that the work does. Um, but you know, going out and, and and doing those sort of fundraising initiatives that we're talking about, and you know, to be able to have your top people come out for something as fun as kicking a field goal at a Blue Bomber game, um, it, it just it takes an initiative like this to the next level. It really, really does. And like I said, we're really, really grateful to the Blue Bombers for allowing us to do this. But the experience that that the participants get to go out there, you don't. So many of us have sit in those stands. You, you shake when the cannon goes off. You maybe get startled a little bit. I know it scares me every time, but um, you, you really feel the energy. But to feel that energy when you go onto the field to compete in this event is just, it's out of this world. Um, so for folks that are listening right now that realize that, you know, what a great program kids sport is and would like to help out. Um, the, the bomber event is on May 31st. Um, the registration to be involved in this starts on Monday. So uh, why don't you kind of like bring it back to the start next week? Where can people go? What do they need to do to say, you know what, I'm going to do my best over the course of the next month or so to help raise funds for kids sport, whether they're doing it as an individual or as part of a team. Yeah, you, so to get involved, it's really simple. You can go to our website. You can also follow us on social media. Uh, we'll have links throughout our social media to register your teams as well. Uh, but if you go to our website at uh, www.kitsportcanada slash Manitoba, uh, you'll be able to register there. Uh, just go to the events page. Uh, right now, it's going to take you basically straight to the news story. But on Monday, uh, from that events page, you're going to be able to click in there. Uh, and it'll take you straight to that registration page where you can register your team. We really encourage people to go in and do that. This next week is kind of that time where you're going to be able to go in, fill in your captain's res registration. You'll be able to invite teammates. So all of your teammates or different people, family members or whomever you're working with uh, it, during this fundraiser, you'll be able to send them links to get all signed up so that on April 22nd, you guys are ready to go. You can hit the ground running. Uh, start sharing your links on social media or however which way you want to do your fundraising, however which way you plan to do it. it, it it's really free for you to do that. Um, and that's part of the excitement as well. But uh, from April 22nd to May 19th is where you're going to be fundraising, going into the community, tell them what you're doing, tell them why you want to do it. We always say, put your why in there. Don't, don't just say you're raising money. Say you're raising money because... Uh, my teammate is uh, part of this and I want him to continue or I want her to be able to continue her dreams. Put your why in there. Uh, go out, do your fundraising until May 19th. On May 20th is when we're going to be able to select the top five funders. Yes, and of course, uh, you know, if there is a team, they'll have one representative from that team. If it's an individual fundraiser, they'll be there. And then five champions of fundraising if you will will uh, team right. up with the uh, football champions the winnipeg blue bombers for kids sport for uh the big event at the uh, preseason game on may 31st dustin uh listen uh, you know this is something i think that's close to many of us that are so involved in sport um we've seen the effects of kids sport you know coast to coast but as well right here as unfortunately demand and needs for this continues so we wish you guys nothing but continued success. We'll uh, be around to hopefully help promote this over the course of the next month or so. And uh, good luck to all the fundraisers. And hopefully it can be out there looking like our old buddy Troy Westwood right <laughs> down the middle and not wide right like he always gets beaked about on social media. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not wide right, straight down the middle, but it's all good fun. And don't, I guess the last thing I should say is don't worry. If you've never kicked a field goal, we are going to have a practice event where we're actually going to teach you guys how to kick the field goal. So everybody's welcome. The individual has to be 16 years or older to participate in the field goal challenge, but get the kids out, get them fundraising, do those things. It, it's going to make a difference. It's going to make you feel good. You're going to kick your spring off in a great way and get moving straight into summer. Well, not to mention getting out there to see the Bombers get at it for the first time in the newly named Princess Auto Stadium as well. So it should be great. So the game, the event is the 31st. Uh, but gang, next week, get to the Kids Sport homepage. We'll have a link in the description of the YouTube of this YouTube uh, uh, event um, today. And the 22nd to May 19th is the fundraising period for the kickoff for Kids Sport for 2024. Dustin, 
Congratulations on all the great work you guys are doing. Continued success and a good luck with the kickoff coming up uh, beginning in earnest next week. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's been a pleasure. All right, great stuff from uh, our pal Dustin at Kids Sport. And again, big thanks to uh, Sport Manitoba and Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries for everything they're doing in the community. And hey, shout out to our guy, Sam Crow. This has to be one of my favorite super chats in a long time. Remus the wise man and Hus the tribal chief, LOL. Have a good weekend, everyone. We're always here for a good bloodline reference on Winnipeg Sports Talk. All right, Marbles is coming up. Uh, we'll give you a last call right now, a minute or two to uh, get your in. If you just popped in, exclamation mark Marbles in the chat. You know how to do it. Remus, during that interview, was trying out some new tracks, so we should have a beauty one for you. Um, let's get to a Breezy Bend golf report. And There's no bigger golf reports for a Breezy Bend all year than the Masters. And Bryson DeChambeau is holding his own. This course today, as I know Ian Vivian pointed out in chat, is playing very, very tough. Um, if you can be around par, under par, you're doing very, very well against the rest of the field. Um, Bryson started off at seven, went down to six, uh, back to seven, back to six, back to seven. He's playing 13 with a one-shot lead over Max Homa. Who was five under yesterday, one under today? He is at six under par, world number one, and favorite Scotty Scheffler, even par on his round right now at six under par. Then at four under is Hoygaard and Danny Willett. Willett is such an incredible story. He hasn't played a competitive round since September, had surgery, completely off the radar coming into this event. He's there at four under par. Uh, Ludwig Aberg right now has the round of the day, I believe, four under par. He's playing 18 at three under. Colin Morikawa has got to three under as well. Uh, Fox, Cantlay there as well. The two unders include Will Zalatoris, Matty Fitzpatrick. Joachim Neiman is, in, is at one right now. Patrick Reed's finished at zero. The uh, Xander Shoffley, Rory McIlroy, even par right now. Tiger Woods will make the cut he is one over he was even par today um very very rough run for our guy Corey connors he was three under par after the eighth he bogeyed nine to go to two under double 10 to go to even double 12 to go to two bounced back with the birdie he is one over par right now still the top canadian phil one over wyndham clark one over Brooks Kepka two over, playing 18. Sergio, two over. He's on the 12th hole right now. My guy, Tony Finau, is two over, three over for his round. Akshay Batia, though, is going to make the cut. Love that. He's in at three over. Projected cut right now is four over par. Uh, guys that are on the wrong end of that, Keegan Bradley, JT Poston. Listen, I was all over Hideki Matsuyama going into this tournament. He is at five over right now. We need some birdies for Decky, so he's playing on the weekend. Uh, no weekend for Siwoo Kim, <coughs> Adam Scott, and Victor Hovland. He's on he's on the seventh hole right now. Through six, he is seven over par. Very very tough run for Vic. Um, all right, let's get Remus back in here just before we do the cool bet lines, Remo. Sounds like Vegas Golden Knights captain Mark Stone's ready to practice again. What do you what do you think about that? Uh, so everyone in our chat has been dying since we started. Talk about Mark Stone. Did you talk about Mark Stone yet? Literally all show. And I don't know what more we can say. I mean, he was hurt. He had the spleen thing. And he went on LTIR. And now it's getting better. And... Eight days before the playoffs, and he's practicing. Coincidentally, he was injured last year, and that the same thing happened where he came back and started skating eight days before the playoffs. Um, he had the what? He had the back injury, and then he had the back injury last year, this year, spleen. Um, and we all know that there's no salary cap in the playoffs. So Vegas, with Stone on LTR, has the last two trade le deadlines have added players that. They would not be able to add otherwise. Um, Noah Hannafin, who they just signed to the long-term contract, 
Hamas hurdle as well. Um, and this is fully, this is allowed. And Frank Cervelli, hockey insider, breaker of news, he's tweeting out huge, you know, the news that Vegas Golden Knights captain Mark Stone cleared to resume practicing with the team. He says, huge eye roll here. I've reported all along that the lacerated spleen is a legitimate, serious injury. There's been no shenanigans. But man, Stone coming back to practice for a second year in a row, one week before playoffs, is some seriously fortuitous timing. I'm with Frank here. I don't know like, I don't know what you're supposed to do. And look, they had the vote. I think it was Tampa a couple years ago who said to all the teams, hey, like, what are we doing here with no salary cap in the playoffs? Like Kane, Patrick Kane had the issue where, you know, he came back from an injury right before. You know, they made some trades and were over the cap when they won the cup. Tampa, we all know with Kucherov. And well, that was Stone the funny thing. Like, give year. Tampa credit. Tampa said, hey, this is, this is not right. Mm-hmm. And everyone said, well, no, we're just going to go along with it. So they said, okay, fine. They went and did it, and they won the cup. And now it seems like Vegas is doing this two years in a row. And I'm with you. Lacerated spleen, goes on the IR in late February. That's a three- to six-month recovery. So if that's the case, if he was going to come back in late May, if they were going to get there, all right, well, that's why it's intended. If he's there at the start of the playoffs, I guess the one positive from my perspective is that this is so obviously um, manipulated in a way that is outside of the intended purpose of the rule that maybe something happens and maybe, you know, there will be changes. Um because guys going on LTIR, and listen, he's not the only one. I mean, the Leafs have been utilizing that. I think the Leafs still have the most on LTIR right now, although I know Vegas made a move this week that maybe puts them ahead of them. There's a bunch of teams that have a ton of money that, you know, are um, are taking advantage of loopholes in the rule. And, you know, I think anyone, if you believe in the integrity of the salary cap, this is BS. Um Mark Stone's a hell of a player, though, and if he's able to play for the Golden Knights in the first round of the playoff, does that make them? Can you imagine being Dallas? You have this great season, and then all of a sudden you might get Vegas with Hurdle and with Mark Stone back in the first round. Um, this is going to rub some people the wrong way. And uh, listen, if you're not a Vegas Golden Knight guy, you, uh, much like Frank, are doing a big-time eye roll right now that um, – they're doing it again. And credit to everyone that said it was. I said, come on, this is a lacerated spleen. There's no way. Apparently there is a way. And uh, it seems to be happening right now as he has been cleared to return to practice, coincidentally, a week before the playoffs begin. Like, I don't, I'm not even, like, mad about it. Like, I don't know. It seems like this luck just happened into their lap. So a lot of people in our chat, very upset, dying for us to rant about it. I mean, I don't know what you would say. Like, uh, they took advantage of uh, of the loophole. I mean, I don't. I'm not going to doubt that he's injured, but um, it's interesting that it did. It's it is interesting that well, it happened I doubt t- it. twice in I a row. Mean, you, I you, I doubt that what has been reported yeah. is true. If he had a lacerated spleen in mid to late February when he went on, that's a three to six month recovery. He's either Superman or they were full of shit, and. <laughs> I think there's major questions as to what the National Hockey League does to make sure that these reported injuries or whatnot are on the up and up. So, uh, listen, this is going to rub a ton of certainly fans the wrong way. And, I mean, imagine being Jim Nill right now and getting Vegas potentially in the first round of the playoffs with all of these guys coming back, obviously working around the system. I Maybe finally, and I, I, I would love to see a clear cut rule. I mean, if you ha- if you're a hard cap league, how the hell does that not happen in the playoffs as well? Doesn't make a lot of sense. So, it was going to take somebody getting screwed big time, and maybe a few times for changes to happen. So the only thing that I will hope is that maybe we see a little bit more 
um, transparency and potentially something done on this because uh, I can tell you many other member clubs in the National Hockey League are going, these freaking guys are doing it again. Good for Vegas. They outsmarted everyone. They've been doing it since they came into the league, Huss, uh, going well, back to the expansion Good for draft. Vegas. Wait a second. That's just straight up. Like, it, it, you're saying it's cool to, like, bullshit injuries, make things up, and directly cheat? Like, that's not I don't, what this was intended to do. I don't think they are. Are they doing that? Mark Stone, he's got a spleen injury. Well, then, how, okay, then how is he cleared to practice right now? That's three to six months. It's been seven weeks. Explain that to me. Really? Is that but the that seems like yes, so really such a that seems like a really short timeline. You said three it to six sure months? does. It sure Seven does, weeks? doesn't it? Seven weeks. That's not even two months. I know. This guy's Superman? <laughs> Either that or something else is up. I don't think they and would we have cheat. to talk to Gary. Gary was pretty adamant that and, and offended that people would think that the Vegas Golden Knights would possibly be up to that. Go back. When was Vegas here last? Go back and watch that segment. It was a very fun segment with myself and Gary. But it did come up, and he bristled at the accusation that the Vegas Golden Knights possibly could be misrepresenting injuries or doing something like that to manipulate the salary cap. And that doesn't sound, when you put it that way, it doesn't sound right. But I don't know, Frank's. Frank, who seems to know everything, he's saying he's got a legitimate injury. We need Adam Schefter to go in and tweet out the medical records to quash all speculation here. I think that's what really needs to happen. That's true. Uh, this was Doug, the- okay, wait. If this was WWE, like they would have like a doctor like examine him in front of everyone, <laughs> clearing them what, of any wrongdoing. Yeah. What about what about com- uh, what about Commissioner Jack Tunney? He yeah, could be around <laughs> making need- a. Uh, it's like. Remember when Lex Luger had that thing in his arm or whatever? I don't know. They need need some doctor to come in and make it a TV show, uh, inspect him. Play the clip. We can't. We, there's no way we can go back and get it right now. It's not like we just have it. This has kind of happened over the course. This but you're, is, for, you're you're free to go back to um, again. What was it? it? Would have been March 28th. March 28th mm-hmm. show. Vegas was in town. Gary joined us. It was a fun segment. We could always use an extra view or two. And if you're listening on the podcast, yes, YouTube, the 28th, Gary. And he did. He bristled at the accusation that some people have that the Vegas Golden Knights could possibly be doing anything other than just following the rules on the up and up and a very serious injury to their captain that was going to keep him out well into the Stanley Cup playoffs. Best case scenario. I'll tweet out the clip and said, look, guys, you heard it here. Gary said... Mark Stone has a le- was legitimately injured. Should I oh, tweet yeah. that? Or you think you know what? That, that would, would that get funny. some reaction? See, Nothing why to would see anyone here. think this? It was very clear that the the insider of the Golden Knights. That's Gary. That's his title, <laughs> Vegas Golden Knights insider. We had the inside scoop. <laughs> he on is it, the insider. He is the insider. There you and, go. There you go. Um, and one other thing. Listen, just before we get uh, the marbles going and cool bet lines. Um, And again, I don't want, like, I'm not doing any victory dances because I was right a month and a half ago that the Coyotes were going to be in Utah right now. I feel terrible for the fans that they do have. And, man, the staff and employees that have been screwed around. Um, It'll be great for the National Hockey League to get away from Alex Marullo. One of the biggest mistakes they ever made was getting in bed with that guy. Um, And it's going to cost them a lot of money. He's going to probably double or triple his investment despite being the worst owner in recent history and frankly being a crook the more we hear about what the way they've operated their business. Um, and it sounds like some people that were quite in on the organization, Remo, for a long time, including Rich Nairn, who was the longtime PR guy that started with them after coming from the Winnipeg Jets, um, have many of the skeletons of the organization that if it does become official next week on the 18th, that the Coyotes are moving to Utah, um, there could definitely be some uh, some very interesting aftermath coming out from uh, people that were in the building. Yeah, this, uh, sorry, Coyotes to Utah, fascinating story. You know, you've been following this for over 10 years. Speaking of finishing the story, it seems like we're about to finish the story uh, on the Coyotes here. And uh, April 18th is the date that we're hearing. John Gambadoro, who from Phoenix, uh, he had it last week on his show on 98.7 FM. 
saying, you know, they were talking with Utah. And he tweets today, I continue to hear uh, the 18th as the day Gary Bettman will make the announcement on the Coyotes being sold to Ryan Smith and the team moving to Salt Lake. All indications are this is the only option and the wheels are in motion for the purchase and transfer of assets. I'm watching a lot of the PHNX YouTube channel. They've done a really good job. Uh, 32 thoughts this morning had a lot. And yeah, you're right. Basically, they need to get away from this Coyotes ownership. There's rumors that they had unpaid hotel bills. Uh, they seem to really like this Ryan Smith. It's going to be great for the league. They're going to have a, a bigger building. More importantly for the players, you know, the Players Association been upset too. Um, we're not going to see any of this garbage where they acquire LTIR players. Like this new owner, he's going to come in. He's going to try to spend money. They have a lot of draft picks, a lot of cap room. It's going to be very intriguing what happens to this Utah team and how they look. You know, a team that's actually going to spend close to the salary cap and not take on... <laughs> On fake contracts. Well, well, and think yeah. about all the draft capital they have yeah. if they want to make some moves to get players. I mean, that's that's one thing. And, and the other side of it is the potential. I mean, we've seen a lot of talk mm. that maybe there's some a divisional shakeup, which might include the Jets being in the same division as Edmonton and Calgary, which I would love. Mm. Um, you know, a quick one-way flight, Canadian dollars, great rivalries, kind of like back to the old Smite days. So uh, so we will see. Tico and Apolli. Victory lap. Come on, Huss. The writing was on the wall. Well, yeah, the writing's been on the wall for 15 years, T. Kona. Here's the thing. When the Utah press conf- uh, press release came out, and everyone was freaking out because the timing of it was when Carter Hart and all those guys were going to get arraigned. By the way, last call. Last, absolute last call. We're closing marbles right now. Um you know, I went on this show. I didn't get a lot of pushback here, but I went on some other shows and said, listen, guys, this is happening. Read the room. I mean, Utah is saying, like, if, if you if you look, don't, stop talking about expansion. That's later. This is about the fact that they said they're ready for a team right now. That was pressure on the Coyotes. The PA wanted them out. You should have seen my mentions. The Rob Peterson show took a picture of me from my visit on their show and put the quote, the Coyotes will be in Utah next year. And I was hearing it from every which way. I'm not going to do that lap, though, because the people that were doing it, I get it. I would have been pissed off, too. We've already lost a team. I know how bad that is. And those people have been screwed around, uh, much like the staff and so many other people. But Utah coming to the league, I think it'll be official next week. And uh, we'll see what that means for the Central uh, well, Central yeah. Division. Oh, yes. Here's this tweet that we were talking about. Yeah, so this is Steve Peters. He's on the PHNX YouTube channel and he used to work for the Coyotes. He says, he says, not sure where this is headed with the Coyotes, but after 23 years working inside the organization, if this turns south, tune in and I'll give a peek behind the curtain. And he says, Rich Nairn is ready. Trust me. We know this, where the skeletons are buried. And he just uh, retired. He started with the Jets, long time with yep. the Coyotes. And then Craig Morgan, who's followed the Coyotes for, for a long time as well. You had him on the old station. He says, I know there's a lot of twists and turns behind the scenes as he says, I'm fully expecting one more plot twist in this Coyote saga. I told someone recently that I might just write a book when this is all finished. His response, it would read like fiction. You know, one talking point on their show yesterday was what's more Huss rumored relocation sites for the coyotes over the last, you know, however long or rumored arena projects. Uh, arenas, Ooh. and so <laughs> you want me to just tell you? Relocation sites minus 125. Speaking of cool It was lines. very close. I think it was like 17 to 16 they listed. Like some of the relocation ones were pretty out there. But, you know, it's the, stan- you know, it's the standard uh, was like Seattle, Utah, Winnipeg, Quebec City, Kansas Houston, City. Houston, KC. Houston. They even said Milwaukee. I don't know. I don't remember. There's some I didn't remember. Hamilton. There were so many, and then they listed like so many different arena sites. They've had so much time, and the NHL is just saying enough. This is getting bad for business. Uh, there's a lot of rumors about this uh, ownership, um, you know, stuff that come out in the Athletic before, stuff that's coming out now that I don't. They don't want to do business anymore, and they're going to give them a billion dollars to walk away. And we'll see how it how it plays out next week. The Coyotes are playing tonight in Edmonton. We should probably get to the. Cool yeah, lines, yeah, yeah, but yeah. We, it, we got to get this podcast up and, and get busy. God knows we spent enough time talking with the Coyotes, and we'll do it again next I week could, when it becomes I, official. I could talk right. about this Coyotes for a while. Okay. I know, I know. I'll, but I'll let's shut get up. ready for marbles. Cool bet lines just before we go. Uh, we uh, there's what is it? we got five games tonight in the NHL. Uh, huge one, Canes at Blues. 
Blues plus 180 at home need to win to keep their playoff hopes alive. I think they might actually get it done. Preds minus 255 in Chicago. I think you can take that one to the bank. Oilers minus 273 at home to the Coyotes. Um, Vegas, inspired by their captain being cleared to practice. I'm sure they'll be good tonight, uh, taking on the Wild. Vegas minus 175 money line favorites. And the Flames and Ducks, Flames minus 135. Anaheim plus 115. In the exclusives, we did do a uh, we took a big swing for the partner parlay today. Uh, the Blues to win at plus 180. Uh, Oilers to win. And the Preds minus one and a half. So Preds to win by two over Chicago. That's boosted up to plus 725. And I'll just take a quick look at the Masters because we do have live odds. Uh, and Scotty Scheffler, who gave one back, he's plus 175 right now. DeChambeau plus 280. Max Homa, 5-1. to one. Uh, Matt Fitzpatrick and Colin Morikawa, 22 to one. Aberg Hogard, 25 to one. That'll be live and updated throughout the week. Promo code WST if you haven't played the played there before at Coolbet, uh, and use promo code for a 100% bonus up to 200 bucks on your first deposit over at Coolbet. All right, Remo, let's get a little Tristan Rivers music. I can tell you, Deshambo just had another birdie. And Scotty Scheffler had a bogey, so Bryson is minus eight, Homa minus six, Scheffler minus five right now at Augusta. But uh, let's do it. It's marbles time. That means Tristan Rivers on WST. It's Friday. Another week of words gone by. All right, Marvel's time on WST. Good luck to everyone. Um, as Remus gets it up, and uh, we'll check out today's course, the winner will receive a WST exclusive hoodie. You can only get it by winning in the Marvel race. If you win, you got to send us an email, let us know your size, and we'll we'll hook you up in the coming days. And by the way, I want to give a big shout out and get well soon to my pal Bozeman who I am now involved in the weekly bet head-to-head -head with he, Ross. It's like a three-way dance now. Uh, but he actually texted me earlier today saying he had a detached retina, was going to go in for emergency surgery, but wanted to make sure that he was getting in the marble race. He was going to get his wife to sign him in. Um, but I guess he had too much fluid in his eye. It's going to happen tomorrow. So he is there watching with one eye somewhere. But was I still hope I beat you. But I hope you're feeling better, and uh, great to have you here with us on our weekly marble race. All right, Remo, how many marbles, and where are we going today? Okay, we got a lot of marbles in here. Two hundred ninety-five. I put you in. I put you in in all caps. Beauty. beauty. That's what I like. Uh, Two ninety-five. Did you say? Yeah. It's... Whoa, that's a big one. Man, we big still got one. like we still got. 500 people in here. So what up, everyone? Thanks for coming in. Uh, yep. Sorry we took so up. long, but this yeah. is uh, it, it's it's happening now. It is happening yeah. now as we watch the Masters and the Marbles. Here, and I do see David Asplund in chat. Us. He's on a plane right now, and he wants us to wish him happy birthday. So happy birthday, David, who's in here all the time. Long time uh, listener. Nicely done, Dave. And a shout out to Hasby, Greg Hasby, too. I was with Greg last night when I got back from Nashville. He is, he entered from somewhere. Uh, I think it was an airport because he's on the way to Denver. He and a bunch of my other buddies are going to be at this game tomorrow night with the uh, Avs and the Avalanche and then going snowboarding for a few days out in uh, Colorado. So uh, good times. Wish I could be there for you. Maybe we'll be back for the playoffs at some point. All right, let's get this track up and uh, 
Get the WST Friday tradition going. Okay, I picked a really good one. It is large glacial. I can't even read my own writing. Do you ever get that, Huss, or you can't read your own writing? Um, large, oh, large gl glacial root. And now I had tested it. Root. I had tested another one, Huss, where like it had, I did a test one with 50 entrants and only four of them <laughs> finished. I think it might have been less. I was like, Huss, should we do this? And apparently last week we it was did a one. bloodletting. Yeah, I, we didn't want to do that again. We want people to finish and feel like they're in. It's not fun when. When you don't have a yeah, chance. Yeah, when everyone's getting thrown over the top rope. So this one should be, but again, it's a new track. We never really know now that we're getting all these user-created ones. Yeah. Oh, um, one sec, one sec. I screwed it up. Here. I screwed it up. Yeah, you can. Oh, let me just fix that story. Derek Schmidt, you're damn right. Tiger has made 24 straight cuts at the Masters. Nobody has ever done that before. Bozeman, if people are saying Bozeman in for the automatic win, speedy recovery, Bozeman, T. Will. Get Vegas to hire Bozeman. He'll be healed up in a couple days. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have really good dog. Remember like Morgan Bear and he got stitches in Vegas. Or yeah, they got really good plastic That's surgeons true. there. They've got, they've got a great medical team. A great, great medical team. Uh, all right. Oh, wow. This looks cool. A shiny start. Um, the large glacial root. 295 one of our biggest ever um hoodie on the line and by the way uh get into the newsletter and to the website we are giving away some moose tickets for the weekend those will be given away tonight only enter if you uh, plan on going on either saturday or sunday all right remo it is friday great week jets are on a roll big game tomorrow let's drop the marbles oh yeah Looks like a big hookah or something like that. <laughs> with, all those, with all those different. I don't know different why it's. Tunes. Oh, yeah. Looks like a G, yeah, genie's lamp or something. It's all metal here. Johnny Rander, Tracy O, Markham Fanasuk, Retro Winnipeg. What's up, Sheps? Oh, 22 Canuck just got knocked out. I don't think Retro Winnipeg, Jason Sheps, has won before. He would be a very popular winner. He's always out at our events and whatnot. It's a good time I, at Hooters at that uh, that game we're at. All right, Lucas. Now things are getting. There is a lot of. Oh, that was. It got busy there. I think we have too many marbles, so the track can only handle so many. So a lot of people just got knocked out. You don't want to have a bad sort. Oh, there's Wayne Bretzky. We met Wayne at the game last week. That the uh, WST game. Okay, are these people still in or getting thrown out? No. Nope. I'm not sure. It's getting crazy here. There's so it many marbles. Like, crazy. like when I practice it, there's like 50, but here there's like 300. So That's the thing. It's just so big. Well, Amy Weave, Larry TSG, I think are still in. Yeah, these are. Yeah, these guys are all in. Oh, no, 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 no. no they're all no, flying. No, Amy's out. Larry, I think, is in the lead here. Nope. <laughs> oh, Larry's out too. Well, so much of our plan. We may have to go back to like the funnel or something for when there's yeah. just so many players in. But Jano, Wayne Bretzky, Rory Brown, all in right now. Russ Lowen, Doug Phil, B. Henderson are there. Jared just got thrown out. Okay, it's Jano, Murray Brown, Wayne Bretzky, Mike Cochran. Elias McCracken, Winnipeg Chaster. Let's see. All right. Tyson Ducharme. Oh, Hustler, I'm still alive here. That's good. That's good. <laughs> okay. Jano, Murray Brown, and Wayne Bretzky. It looks like we're going into a big funnel here. A funnel and then the spinning globe. And then where's the finish here? I think the finish is coming right up here. Yes, it's right there is the finish. So whoever comes okay. out of this globe. Jano looking good. Murray Brown looking good. Who will it be? Oh, my God. Oh, they didn't get it. No. Oh, no, Jano did get in. Jano got it. I see it. It's like a finish line to go yeah. through. 
Wow, I thought we were going to have even more disasters. Just tell me I'm finishing here, folks. Come on. Congratulations to everyone that finished and did get... Yeah, there I am. I got across the line. That's big. It could be big for our head-to-head -head bet with my buddies. Feel free to bet against each other if you'd like to. We'll always go through all of the, all of the marbles. Even on a show like this where we've gone very, very late. Let's see what happens. Who's still in? Royal Sports Team Sales is in. People back at the shop. All that great white, white out stuff's there, by the way, gang. They just got a whole whack load of more white out uh, stuff. The white overalls as well. Oh, look at Bridget get. Oh, no. Bridget got eaten by the fire right before. Jano 101. Congratulations. Send us the email, oh, Jano. Look how close Winifred that is. Sports talk at gmail.com. Let us know what size you are as well. We can set up a, a pick at some point as well. Oh, there we are. De oh, Dia. Nicely done. Good thing you're not in the head-to-head -head bet with uh, your husband and myself. Uh, but let's see. We, we don't know yet. It could be Ross. It could be B. Henderson. Dea. Top 10. Nicely done. Ray W. Shep's pretty good performance there. Oogie Oglethorpe. Isha Boy Bruce getting through. Sean Mason. Zachary Wynn. What's up, Zach? We'll see you in 316 sometime soon. There's Mary Jane. All caps, Kyle. Oh, there's me, Hustler, 81st. Keep her going, Reem. Royal Sports Payables there. The accountants are in the marble race. Nice to see. McCullough, Doug's for everyone. Kochi, Pig City Hawks fan, Atomic. So I actually did have about half. Oh, there's for Tanny. What's up, Todd? What half of the group or so did get through? Oh, Ross. Ross was uh, 180 or so. Nicely done, Ross. Still got the dub. Oh, and, the, oh, and Bozeman got through too. And Amanda. <coughs> wow. Royal Sports. Well, George. And then everybody else who was not lucky enough to cross the line. Well, quite the race today. I mean, a huge, huge number. We'll have to try a few more with some big numbers and see one that can actually uh, work through. Oh, Max Homa's in the clubhouse at Augusta doing an interview right now. Um, at final, look. Oh, DeChambeau just bogeyed. He's at seven under. Max, six under. Scheffler, six under. Bogey for Scotty on number eight. Should be a great weekend of Masters action, everybody. Ooh, Colin Marikawa, three under as well. Um, shout out to everyone that stuck around for the Marble Race. Mike McIntyre, Brandon Rewicki, our friends from Kid Sport, Dustin Air coming on as well, and to all of our sponsors. Thanks so much. We got to get the pod up. Enjoy the game tomorrow. We'll see you Monday to talk about the final week of the regular season and a look ahead to the playoffs on WST. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down! Oh, Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.